Jim committed fell. Two evening ago, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. We look to the past for inspiration. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. That's one small step for man. And now, a new generation of space explorers is on the rise. This is a time of true greatness, and it all starts here, in the students with the exploration and development of space at Rice University.
like to get involved with a CubeSat that will be going to space and a satellite that will be going to low Earth orbit, please make sure to stop by our booth and join our team. Now I would like to introduce Leanne Johnson to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Mr. Mark Geyer. Mr. Mark Geyer began his career at NASA Johnson in 1990 and was soon involved with the International Space Station program in 1994, where he served a variety of roles. From 2005 to 2007, he served as Deputy Program Manager of the Constellation program and later transitioned to manage the Ryan program till 2015. He served as Deputy Center Director at NASA Johnson till 2017 and later went on to serve as the Acting Deputy Associate Administrator for the Human Explorations and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters in Washington. Currently, he is the 12th Director of NASA's Johnson Space Center and leads a workforce of approximately 10,000 civil servant and contractor employees at one of NASA's largest installations in Houston and the White Sands Test Facility in Las Cruces, New Mexico. He is the recipient of the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, Meritorious Executive Rank Award, and the Distinguished Executive Rank Award. Now please let's welcome Mr. Mark Kyron. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Where'd Ryan go? There he is over there. Okay. Thank you for inviting me uh, to this event. Um, and also, uh, I want to thank you for your leadership. You know, it's it's great to when you're in college and space seems like a cool thing to do, but it really does take leadership to focus a team and try things like this CubeSat and get involved. And you know, so it's a great example of you don't have to wait and become part of just one of many in these large programs that are all us actually smaller things you can get involved with that are actually impacting what we're doing in space. So thank you for your leadership. Um, you'll notice I didn't go to Rice. I won't say where I went uh, to school, uh, go Boilers, but still, uh, still, you know, we have a great tradition at NASA of Rice grads, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So one of our slogans uh, at Johnson, or actually our main slogan, is the giant leap start here. Of course, that relates to uh, Neil Armstrong's famous uh, speech when he landed on the moon. Uh, the Johnson Space Center, as, as was said, has about 10,000 people. We have a great tradition of great experience and leadership. Um, but actually, we're entering into a very, very exciting and interesting phase of human spaceflight. When I was... Um, I'll admit it, I was 10 when we landed on the moon, and uh, I was in college when the, the Columbia first uh, launched and landed. I remember watching it from the Memorial Union of Purdue University, watching the Columbia land. So I watched the first major uh, event um, as a young person and a student, and then I was, I was blessed, as was said in the, in the reading, to become part of the space station as we were building that, and it was an incredible experience. Um, so in our past, we've had these very large programs, Apollo Shuttle Station, and you'll see as I go through this now, we have a very diverse set of projects and programs that are happening, which I think is great uh, for the young people that are coming up because it gives you a, lot, a wide variety of things that you can participate in. So um, next page is a, is a video, so watch the video. Still dream of what could be. We did. We did. An 
what many thought we were through, no. We've been learning, we've been building, we've been training. And now, it's time. Because the next frontier is not just for the next generation. It's for this generation. It's for me, and it's for you. For everything we still dream about. We go. So I really like that video. So it talks a little bit about, I'll, I'll go through that, but that is the, Artemis is the name of our, our program that's getting us back to the moon uh, with the first woman and the next man. And what I love about that video, it talks about the people, right? The hardware is always cool, but the hardware, you don't have hardware like that. Um, without the people to make it happen. And I also like the fact the crew is heavily involved in this video. That's one of the, I think one of the blessings of working at the Johnson Space Center is that we work uh, every day with the folks who risk their lives for you and me and for this world to explore outer space. And so just Nicole Mann is one of the superstars. And so she's highlighted in that video. Anyway, um, so why are we going to the moon? This, some people might think this is obvious. Uh, uh, if you're in this room, you like space, you're interested in space, you might think, well, sure. But this is often the conversation we'll have with um, our representatives and, and senators about the other fundamental things people sometimes don't always think about. Why go to the moon? So first of all, we know we have this long-term goal to go to Mars. And, and uh, we can talk about that a little bit, but going to Mars is kind of our next big goal. It's a very hard thing to do. And so a lot of the technologies we'll look at to get to the moon help us bridge that gap to go to Mars. Uh, the second item is it establishes American leadership and strategic presence. So um, the world, many countries in the world are doing things in space, but uh, clearly the United States is the leader. If you look at the International Space Station, there would not be an International Space Station without the United States. And it took the United States putting the proposal together and actually creating an opportunity for the partners to follow us uh, that allowed that to happen. That was, same thing will happen at the moon. Uh, this time, of course, we're going to the moon with our partners. Uh, but that is a strategic imperative that we continue to lead so they go with us, right? Because there are other people that would like to go to the moon and they would like the partners to go with them. So I think that's pretty straightforward. Uh, it does inspire a new generation. This is clear because you're here. Right, there's some part of us that loves going in space, but the actual missions are the things that drive excitement. I remember that, right? Apollo shuttle drove my interest, and in certainly in, in studying engineering. And I had a lot of friends who studied engineering and technical fields, even though they never ended up at NASA, they ended up in petroleum or other things. But those inspiring missions do change people's attitudes about technical fields. Um, we do develop some technologies to make those missions happen that impact uh, our, our, our daily lives. <clears throat> There's a global economic impact. Uh, we'll see some of that, but if you look at the way space station is buying cargo delivery and now it's buying crew delivery, we're creating capabilities in the United States, launch capabilities that did not exist before and they are there because of the, the ISS as a goal, as a destination for cargo and crew. So the United States is developing capability and we're bringing work back to the United States um, and it broadens our industry international partners as well because the companies now start working together as well in space so some of that's obvious some of that I think it's good to remember uh, we're going to the moon again it says reasonable risks I would say the moon is still risky but we are going to prove out some things that it's much better proved when you're five days away as opposed to being years away. And so again, this gives us a chance to flesh those concepts out. Uh, I mentioned the Artemis program. Of course, you probably already know Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. Um, and so it per personifies this new plan. Our, also, our plan also, not just uh, the first woman, next man, but also to target areas of the moon that we did not go in Apollo. Apollo was fundamentally around the equator. Basically, we're looking to go to the South Pole. You might know South Pole, we're already seen some really interesting things related to ice, water ice, and other things that are at the South Pole. So a very strategic place to go. Uh, so uh, NASA
that's just kind of broken up the plan in two phases. The first phase is, look, let's get back, let's land by 2024 uh, and create, create the capabilities needed to do that. I would characterize phase two as, let's make it a sustainable plan that allows us to you know, stay within a reasonable budget and give us capability to go further out into space. So phase one, we call this the swoosh chart because it's swooshing across the horizon there. But it shows the early stuff and the big pieces. So you see Orion uh, flying. Uh, you remember uh, the LRO mission, which is still there, giving us a lot of important information about the moon. Um, then we start building what we call a gateway, which is an orbiting platform around the moon that enables a lot of things, access at different parts of the surface, as well as potentially reusing the lunar lander, which in Apollo we threw away, gives us a place to go and reuse the lander. Um, it also helps us test out things that we're going to need when we go to Mars as far as transfer stages and, and places to stage equipment. Um, so early on we'll have a place for Orion to dock, the crew will be there and that's where the lander. We have two options, the lander could go to Gateway, in the long run I believe it will. In the early flights it doesn't have to, uh, we could just be docking with Gateway and then the lander could go to the surface. On the bottom uh, really talks about some of the early things that we're doing. Uh, First, we're going to fly again a payload, small payloads to the lunar surface to one, uh, basically learn about the South Pole and other regions of the moon we want to go to. So when we actually send people, we're targeted where we want to go. And there are a couple things here, right here at JSC, um, that we're doing to enable this. The first is called Commercial Lunar Payload Services, where we are buying a lander service. So we say, hey, here's about the payload we want to fly. Uh, this is when we want to fly it. You Maybe you have a small company, you bid, I would like to do that, here's how much I'm going to charge. Then we come out with specific payloads, you bid against those, and so we've already selected two companies. Um, one of which is actually based in Houston that will be flying to the moon, small payloads to the moon. Uh, and then you'll see that Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, which spells Viper, strangely enough, not by coincidence, spells a viper. Sounds cool. Um, but basically, it's, it's a rover that allows us to investigate um, the materials on the surface of the moon, including water, ice, where is it, what is it, what is the consistency, how hard is it going to be able to be used. That rover is actually built here at the Johnson Space Center, uh, and it'll be blown on one of these CLIPS uh, lunar de uh, payload delivery services. Then we're looking at increasing our cargo size and then eventually of course actually having people back on the surface. Uh, so I think I've walked through this. Uh, I think I'll go I think I'll go to the next page. So I wanted to show you that um, some of that is in development. Some of it is really about ready to fly. Though on the far left is a picture of the Orion uh, capsule and service module that's actually in this picture it's actually in Ohio because we have our Plumbrook Station uh, vacuum chamber test. Thermal vac chamber is one of the most capable, largest in the world, so we shipped Orion up there. Orion just went through its two big hot and cold cycles. Everything went great. Now it's doing a, a EMI, you know, electric mechanical um, testing to make sure that the environment we expect to see uh, in space doesn't mess with the uh, electronics more than we expect that it will. It's going great. I expect it to be back in Florida in March, and it'll be done, fundamentally done in May. In the middle, and I'm done for the next, for the first flight. The middle is the rocket. Uh, the rocket SLS, I think you probably know it's the most capable rocket since the Saturn V. Um, you see the four engines, you're looking at the back end of it. That rocket now is actually, it's built in Louisiana, it's been shipped to Mississippi, it's actually in the test stand in Mississippi where we'll actually fire those engines in a test stand uh, before we ship it to Florida. So it's called the Green Run, which basically means we're going to run it like it's going to fly, we're going to test the envelope, we're going to make sure the system works, and it's on the flight unit, and then we'll send the flight unit to Florida and it'll be ready to fly. So the rocket is getting very close to being done, and so I expect early next year it'll be in Florida. On the far right is the launch tower. Obviously you need a launch tower to to put the rocket up against and get the crew there. That is also in the final stages of being ready. So this first part of the swoosh that is sending the capsule and people to to the lunar region is 
in that stage of development. No more PowerPoint. We're about we're ready to fly. Um, I talked about the gateway. The gateway um, will uh, help our sustainability on the surface of the moon. You see Orion docks to it. The gateway fundamentally is a it has a um, a power propulsion element on the front end that's basically using solar electric propulsion uh, to keep us uh, and be able to move the orbit around. And it also has a small habitation area at the beginning where Orion can dock, the crew can get in and out, do, do research and others, and then also it provides a docking port for the lander. So in the long run, we expect the lander and Orion both to be using the gateway, and as you see in the lander, just below that circle is the ascent module, and that's the part where you have all the avionics, where all the crew stuff is, and the goal is to really get to a point where this node, this gateway, allows us to reuse that ascent module. You remember in Apollo, we threw the landers away every time. And you can imagine that ascent module, the lander, is one of the most complicated and expensive elements in this architecture. So being able to reuse that will be really, really important. Uh, next page. So we know that um, there's a lot of technology still to go, uh, especially in the out years before we go to to uh, Mars, we know we, we're talking about a sustainable power a capability, dust mitigation. Of course, dust on the moon is different than Mars, as you know, uh, but still looking at how to keep that um, the dust from the folks that get on the surface uh, and reduce it to a reasonable amount before the people get in the ascent module, then before they get to the gateway, before they get in Orion, you don't want to be carrying that dust around with you all the time, and that's complicated to do. We're learning a lot about improving that. Um, one of the key ones there in the middle called East in situ research resource utilization, sorry, is again, let's figure out how to use the materials on the surface of the moon. And of course, those materials will be different in Mars, but also just the process of how we gather those materials, how we break them down into the, into the components we need, for example, water, and then use them uh, either for the crew or for propulsion. So that's one of the big things that we'll be looking at. Uh, at the moon. So a lot of things there that we're going to learn on the moon that will feed forward to to Mars. So phase two is really about sustainability and this I would just say this is extends again to we'll have more habitation on the gateway so we can stay longer in orbit. That means we can have longer missions on the surface of the moon as well uh, and then increase the reusability of the systems before we head on to Mars. So I think I've talked about that. I did want to mention something, so I wanted to focus on Artemis since that's our, the big mission to get back to the moon. But a lot of what we're using and our experience with how humans, how their bodies change and how we can adapt to that and mitigate those risks is because of ISS. So in November, we will have had Americans in space continuously for 20 years. So many of you look a little less than 20 or close to 20. So uh, you might not have been born when there wasn't an American in space, uh, and that's because of the ISS. So many of us, a uh, few of us in this room, of course, were a big part of making International Space Station happen. Um, what we highlight in this video, or in this, excuse me, in this picture, Christina was up there over 300 days. Um, she also did a phenomenal job, one of those astronauts that just knocks it out of the park. Great uh, attitude and, and great ability to do uh, the things we needed to do on space station. Of course, she and Jessica actually went outside and uh, upgraded our battery system, and it happened to be the first all-female spacewalk, so that was a great achievement as well. So, uh, Christina's home, you might have seen the video of her dog greeting her. Uh, very cool. Um, anyway, she's just there. She and Jessica are phenomenal. So, but it's an example of um, space station is giving us more experience for uh, what it means to be in space. Early in space flight, we saw, even with the Mercury and Gemini guys, we saw things that would happen to the body. For example, uh, bone, bone loss, right? Because your body, your bones aren't getting loaded, so your body is really incredible machine. It's going, why am I putting calcium in these bones? I don't need it. So they come home and the bones would be weaker. We'd find other issues, right? Same with uh, muscles. So we knew on station we were going to have to work through that. A lot of work in shuttle to learn how to do that. Now on station with the treadmill and we have an actually, a, they call it A-RED, it's basically a, a, a Nautilus system in space. Um, we're finding the crew comes back and bone loss is not an issue. In fact, they, they're very fit. They have some time, so they work out a lot. 
So we found we're actually mitigating this particular issue pretty much completely. But what we're finding, that is, they're staying long, we're finding other issues. You might have seen some issues we've seen with the, with the eyes, um, with some, some folds in the retina. Uh, we knew some of that is caused, we think, by fluid shifts in the body, but there's other things that we think contribute to that. So these are things we need to, and it doesn't happen to everybody, so it happens to some, we think it's, there's a genetic link too. So this is an example of we're seeing things the longer they stay, some things we didn't expect, and so now we've got to figure out how to we would get those. So you can imagine, when you send somebody on a trip to Mars, this would be really bad to find out halfway there. Hey, I, you know, I didn't expect this, and there's no way to mitigate it. Because once they go to Mars, you cannot send something to them like you can to station. They, they're going to take everything with them when they go. So station is critical to, uh, to that, to our understanding how to live and work in space. Uh, I wanted to show you these pictures. Uh, on the left, of course, is the Boeing uh, Starliner, the UFT launch that landed. This was our, our, our first in America, our first land landing system, which is a great capability. Uh, it was a terrific landing. Um, and it, 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 you can imagine the crew, they love landing on land because <laughs> you're, you're not moving anymore. Uh, it, you get a lot of, uh, in space, um, your inner ear, of course, uh, adapts, and when you land, you can be kind of nauseous. So they love this idea of landing on land. The other nice thing is you can, you're can you more likely to be able to reuse the capsule, right? It doesn't have salt water impact, the loads are less. So it's a great concept, we'll see. On the right is SpaceX. Uh, that was their Demo 1 launch. Um, I expect very soon, uh, this summer, early summer, we'll, we will be flying Americans on American spacecraft and, and very likely it will be Demo 2, SpaceX, and Doug and Bob will be heading to space station, I think, in the early summer, so terrific work. And I think by the end of the year, it's very likely with Boeing will also be flying, so we'll have two companies, not just one, but two companies. Um, and if you've been working at JSC, you know, I love the Russians. They have done such a great job with us and work on space station. They're great partners in space. Uh, be clear, they're great partners in space. Um, uh, and but we've been flying Americans on a Soyuz for nine years. It's hard to believe nine years because of policy changes in the past. So it's going to be great to have uh, Americans flying on these two vehicles in this year. Very very important. And also gets our number up. Right now we're at six. We start flying these four people on these vehicles, we'll be at seven people on ISS continuously. Uh, I'm trying to make sure what my time is. Is there a time around here? Oh, that's me. Oh, hang on. Yeah, so this was the most important video in the whole stuff. So I got to shoot this first shot at Johnson. Why did it bounces four times? But it counts. Uh, <laughs> The ball is dead, just to give you a clue, if you ever do that, the ball is dead because they don't want it to ricochet off and hit a player. They weren't worried about me, they were worried about a player. Um, so the ball is dead, you got to know that's why it bounced four times. Anyway, this was just to show our outreach, so we did some things. There's my deputy, Vanessa Weiss, on the lower right. She also did a first shot at, in Houston. Uh, hers did not go in, but I just thought I would mention that. Uh, Peggy Woodson's her shot went in, so Peggy and I are, are anyway. Uh, upper, upper, upper left uh, is the day of remembrance. You know that we have a great history uh, at NASA, but we've also had some pretty uh, significant accidents with Apollo 1, Columbia, and Challenger. And every year in January, we have a day of remembrance at JSC. We have a grove of trees that has the names of the astronauts who have passed, uh, and we take time to actually uh, remember them uh, and place roses in their trees. They're still the family members that come out to uh, to um, help be a part of that event. It's a very moving event. And it's important for the team to remember, again, that the astronauts are the ones who risk their lives for us, and it's our duty to make sure uh, that we understand the risks and the missions that we're about to send them on. Uh, and then the lower right is uh, was the Martin Luther King Day Parade, and uh, we have employee resource groups uh, like the African American Employee Resource Groups, and we were out there uh, on, at, at the parade. It was a bit cold that day, but it was an awesome parade. It was great to be a part of that. So that just shows you some of the outreach we do in the local community. 
Um, so, there have been a lot of Rice alumni at NASA. These are the current ones. Uh, six of them are on staff, and um, we have 14 astronauts. And we have a few in the audience here. Paul Marshall is there, Mr. Orion. Paul Marshall is here. Wayne Hale is here. Mark Craig. Yes, those guys are all icons at JSC. Uh, did you go to Rice, Chris? No, you're just a famous guy. <laughs> You're on a panel. Thank you for being here today. Anyway, great school, great tradition. And then this, of course, this dude went to Rice. <laughs> he looks familiar. I really, uh, Jim, I just want to say, and this is not um, just because I'm here, I think Jim is one of the best administrators that I have ever worked for, and I've worked for six. And Jim has a passion for NASA, and Jim knows that you've got to take that passion and connect with people. And, and connect with our elected officials in order to give us a sustainable space program. And he's, I, he's one of the best that I've ever worked for. Um, and I'm not just saying this because this is webcast and then he might watch it later. <laughs> um, well here, uh, we were talking about what would be cool to show to this group. And so one of the things we thought we would do was there's a lot of programs uh, that students can get involved in. So I appreciate Ryan talking about the CubeSat. That's a great one. We also do MicroG Next, where uh, students do experiments and then we put it in the water. The water allows you to uh, simulate to some degree weightlessness. And so they, sometimes they've simulated tools to do repairs in space. They design them, the divers go down and test it out, right, and they see how it works. So that, that's a student uh, involved. The, the robotics, or lunar robotics is another example. I put the link there and they're in the charts. So if you're interested in one of these programs, you can do that. These are not those, uh, these are not all JSC programs. Um, these are across NASA. NASA Suits, Spacecraft User Interface Technologies is another one. The Big Idea Challenge is another one. Great programs. Uh, of course, I saw your rocket out there. And Yusuf and I were talking about how easy it must be to launch a rocket in the middle of the city of Houston. It must be a piece of cake. Um, you can see how big these are, and they, they have a lot of challenge to make those happen. So I applaud you for doing that. Very interesting. Then, of course, the NASA Human Exploration Rover Challenge is a big one out of, at Marshall. Um, a lot of fun, too. Uh, and then, of course, you can become an intern. You probably have noticed the folks in this audience probably are already type A's. Go get them, but you might already know you can be an intern at NASA. That's the link. Uh, we'll have, we have summer folks, and the deadline is coming up, March 8th, uh, and then the fall. So we look forward to seeing some of you out there uh, and helping us do our job. This incredible job we have. And then, if you already have graduated and you have a master's, which is now the new requirement, you have to have a master's, but um, you can be an astronaut. So we're taking applications. The last time we did this, we had 18,000 people apply. I expect we will have many more this time. Uh, it tells you, again, the interest about how, how excited people are about this. Um, we had a great uh, astronaut graduation event. I don't know if you saw it recently. Uh, and you, maybe if you got a chance to look at it, you got to see what kind of people these are. And I don't just mean they're doing incredible things, right? They make me look like a slacker, all the things that they've accomplished. But they're also really good people and good leaders. And if you see the event, you hear them talk about each other. And uh, anyway, it's great to be working with them. So you have till the end of March. Um, we look forward to getting more and more Rice grads being astronauts. That would be cool. I think Purdue's still number one, but I just thought I would mention that. Yeah. Say again? No, per capita. Oh, per capita. Okay, sure. Yeah. I'm sure there's a statistic we could find, but that's good. That's good. Yeah. A&M only has one, as far as I know, so yeah, you can rub it in. Um, and then, of course, these are links to our social media sites, most of which I don't know how to use, and it's better than I stay off of. But um, the usual uh, areas, and you can learn a lot about what JSC is doing and, and get really good pictures and uh, status on our hardware and so forth. So I, I think I was supposed to have time for questions. I can't tell what the timer says. Do you guys know? I don't see a timer on here. But uh, I will take questions now. Except from the Rice graduates, so I won't. Yeah, that's nice. Any questions? Yes, sir. I was just going to wrap it up. Okay, good. No questions. Yes, sir. Have you seen the 
we've selected the crew for Artemis 2 yet? Good question. I'll repeat it. Uh, have we selected the crew for Artemis 2? The answer is no. Um, I expect two things are going to happen. One, we have to confirm the launch date for Artemis 2. And some of that relates to when Artemis 1 launches, because Orion actually reuses uh, avionics from Artemis 1, and, and Kennedy has to do some up, updating of the mobile launch platform. So we, once we settle on Artemis 1, we'll know Artemis 2. And then normally about two years out, we go select a crew. So we're close, though. We're close. And we, 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 we as a country, we're blessed, because we've got some great people that are ready to go do this mission. We'll do an awesome job and represent this country. Yeah, so you know, relatively soon, I hope. <coughs> Great question. Yes, yes. How, how much of an impact could the presidential election have on the funding mechanism going forward? Great question. How much could the presidential election have an impact on NASA's funding and the strategy? So it could be, it could be the president or it could be the House and the Senate. I've seen both uh, changes and uh, um, uh, two things. So we are really blessed to live in this country where we have peaceful transitions of government. I think we take that for granted, right? In a lot of places in the world that is not the case. Um, and so they, these transitions are by definition going to happen, especially presidents. Eight years is all you get. Um, so we've lived through a few of those and some of those I would say were not awesome because the, 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 the fluctuation was so significant. Um, in fact, I would just be so bold to say that's why we've been flying people on Soyuz's for nine years, is because we had a big shift where we did not have agreement on the strategy. So uh, it could, it could. I would say, uh, again, back to Jim Bridenstine, who again, I think is one of the best. He's done a great job of, of talking about why this mission is important. And it's bigger than one administration. And he's connected with uh, people across the aisle. They had a great event in California where Nancy Pelosi came and they talked. she talked about Artemis and how important it was to her. Um, so if you can think of anything across the aisle these days, uh, and when I go to Congress now, and I, we have Democrats uh, that um, are part of these key committees in Oklahoma and Texas, and of course we have Republicans down, down where we live too that are part of that, um, and even in the city of Houston Democrats. When I talk to them, they all love the mission. They, they, they maybe would quibble over NASA's total budget. <laughs> should we go up 12%? Should we go up from right? The budget's tight. But I like that. Well, we're talking about that, not yes or no. So I, I'm encouraged. But as a, 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 all of you are voters, you all look over 18. So um, I encourage you to think about that. You know, I know there are big things in this country. But space policy is something to think about. It's a leadership thing for the United States. So what are the, what are the, what are the candidates saying? I think is worth asking. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question, because I can tell you it's on my mind as a leader of this great team. Uh, what we've gone through in the past, we really need to be move forward, right? Keep moving out into the solar system. Yeah, thank you. That was a great question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Please, Please one more question. OK, good. What do you think about the NASA authorization bill that's being discussed in the House as it relates to changes to our approach to the laws? Good. Uh, the question was about the NASA Authorization Act uh, bill, which is uh, from the on the House side. I think is the one you're talking about, and what my what my impression was. So I'll go back to the fundamental thing: is that it is a joint agreement across the aisle. And so when I look at it that way and say they jointly agree we're going back to the moon, they jointly agree we're going to use the fundamental elements that we have in work, they, there are some subtleties about how we do the lander, some questions on the funding level and on the date. I say, like, boy, I can work that, right? We will work together. So I, I liked it. You know, if I got to write everything myself, if it was a dictator, would I change the things? Sure. But I think in this environment, the fact this is a Republican-Democrat agreement, uh, I thought it was great. I'll take it. Right, I'll take it. Okay, good. Thank you. Great questions. Thanks for your time. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, now let's watch a short video while we switch over to our Moon to Mars panel. 
I request our panelists to come and take their seats during the video. Fifty years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. Well, many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon as a new generation of explorers. This time to stay and to prepare to achieve humanity's next journey of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wonder if we could return. For all who dream of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. Johnson uh, while I was getting my MBA here. I was working in the technology transfer office, um, helping them value technology as it was being spun out into to businesses. Um, this was before Elon had ever had a successful first flight, so the idea of space startups was still really crazy. Now it's kind of crazy today, but 10 years ago it was really crazy. Um, but we're start, uh, uh, what's so exciting to me is the change in that environment that I've been able to witness over the last decade. Um, uh, my partner and I recently founded Space Fund, which is a venture capital firm investing in those space startups. Um, as you're starting to see this major economic change in space, while well, it's always thrilling and exciting and wonderful, and I'm happy to support in any way I can the, the great work that our governments and other governments are doing, um, the real shift lately has been how much of this is commercial. The commercial resupply to the ISS, soon the commercial astronauts to the ISS, and all of the hundreds and thousands of companies that are benefiting from that shift to a more commercial perspective, especially in LEO, as NASA moves out to the moon and Mars. Um, so we're very interested from the finance side on obviously capitalizing on that, um, and that's really where my interest and in, in background Good afternoon. I'm the token non-rice graduate on the panel here. <laughs> I'm Chris Culbert. Um, I lead the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program that Mark mentioned earlier. Um, I've been at JSC now for 38 years. It's been a long time. I was fortunate to come straight out of college right into JSC. A lot has changed over the last you know, 30 plus years at Johnson Space Center, but some things remain the same. We still are deeply committed to putting people into space. That's what Johnson Space Center is all about. 
But what's changed a lot is how we want to do that, how we go about it. And we'll spend some time talking a little bit about um, some of the opportunities that represents for the things you all are interested in, the things that you might have a chance to do in your careers. This has been a marvelous place to do interesting work, and Johnson Space Center is at the center of an awful lot of very important things to get it done. But that's changing. The universe that you all will work in, the careers you have, will look very different. You'll have different opportunities. You'll have opportunities to make impact in ways that don't depend upon NASA deciding everything. So I think it'll be an interesting discussion. I look forward to it. Hi, I'm Amy Kwan. I got my uh, bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Rice back in 05. Um, I was also an intern at JSC uh, when I was in school. Um, then I went to UT Austin for my master's in mechanical engineering before uh, joining the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. Um, I've been lucky to be a mechanical integration engineer um, during my career. I first started working on the Curiosity rover um, that you're probably familiar with on Mars. Um, I've also worked on Juno, so these days if you see fantastic new pictures of Jupiter out there, that's probably from what Juno's sending back. Um, I've also worked on Mars Helicopter, which we're very excited about, uh, to go with the 2020 rover this July. And right now I'm working on the Europa Clipper mission, um, which will be going to Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter, um, sometime soon in the 2020s. Great. Okay, so let's get started. Um, the first question that I have for you guys is, um, how do you feel um, exploring the moon will help with the planning for you know, exploring the Mars, or also perhaps settling on Mars? That's uh, so, one of the great things and the great partnership between NASA and industry is, you know, when NASA says, we go, we look at industry and industry says, we do, right? And so, and when you look at the Moon to Mars initiative and the Artemis mission, we're all in. Um, when we work, and I, the work that I do, both as an engineer and then as a long-term business plan approach and working with our NASA partners, is is across the board, right? On the Boeing Starliner system and commercial crew, lowering the cost of assured and safe access to the International Space Station and building that lower urban economy, which allows NASA and the faith dollars of the American taxpayer to go forward to push the technology uh, portfolio on critical needs we have to go to the moon, to stay on the moon. Uh, the incredible investment and the importance of the space launch system and the rocket to go to the moon. The fact that in a time of transition, this rocket and this program and this uh, mission has been enduring uh, to keep the, some amazingly critical skills for this United States of America in the area of human spaceflight intact um, and is now coming to fruition. Or the rocket that is at the B-2 test stand in Mississippi is the rocket that will take us around the moon. Um, and so, a sure axis of an 8.4 meter size diameter to entrepreneurs, to other companies, to the lunar lander provides a fertile, uh, sustainable, and assured payload of which you can be really creative to test and further technologies. Um, and so, when as we work in our portfolio and also working on space station and pushing the boundaries of long-term sustainable space flight and maintaining and working with NASA every day on space station operations, you have the greatest opportunity uh, to come and help that. And so, one, lowering the cost where you know you have assured technical integrity and understanding of your systems allows you to invest in research and development in partnership with NASA on the technologies you need to go land on the moon. A robust, large rocket, to, to, which is basically a wide open etch a sketch of what can you launch up there in a very robust and sustainable way. And then very soon, uh, the, the human lander system. So getting there and then creating the ecosystem. I think it's something that all of us, whether you work in NASA and industry, are all in for. That's what we're going for. And I can't forget my good friend Larry Price with Orion. You know, these are the integral puzzle pieces that will make that happen. And they exist today. And that's something that is very important for us to understand in terms of what the future has forward for investment and to open that market. Oh, okay, sure. So I'll just note the, the we, we should, you know, Mark mentioned how important ISS has been, the space station has been towards teaching us what it takes to, to work and live in space. 
Space is not a normal habitat, natural habitat for human beings. Um, our bodies behave differently, a lot of things change. Utilizing the moon as a way to get ready for Mars in the same sense that we use ISS to help us understand what we need to do to get ready for longer duration missions and how humans adapt is very critical. And moon gives us the opportunity to do that kind of testing environment that, while it's not friendly, is at least relatively close. Oh, okay. Um, so the next question that I have for you guys is, uh, what technology do you believe will be the most useful in creating a sustainable human space program um, that will even like, lead to setting up other planets and development of commercial um, opportunities in space? You can't defy physics. You need a lander to go to the moon, <laughs> right? So having a system that gives you the sustainable access that takes away the uh, questioning of sustainability, you can't help but use an iconic image of the first woman on the moon and say we are there and we are now here to stay. That opens up for us sustainability in terms of mission and our engineers uh, dialing in the technology that have margin because when you go for the first time, when you design something for the first time, when you launch and test something for the first time, you're learning. And so uh, you're going to tweak the technology that you know is robust enough to get the first woman on the moon and then make it even better, more efficient. The ability to then carry more cargo um, is one. And then two, uh, I think NASA's approaches of, of commercial and, and the industrial base is, is important because um, as NASA goes, as you understand, and as NASA understands the environment which you're landing, they go on to the next very big giant leap. And with that comes the commercial partnership and the commercial technologies along with that. Um, but yeah, you can't be physics, you need a lander, but that will mean so much for all of the partners involved. And so my, as I mentioned earlier, my perspective is a little different, right? It's not so much from the technology side, it's from the economic and the financing side. And for me, the, the thing that will help the most with um, with the U.S. specifically, being successful at being a leader both on the moon and Mars, is developing that robust commercial ecosystem, developing the entrepreneurial ecosystem, because that's where you're going to get the really innovative technologies. Uh, no offense to the big companies and, 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 the, uh, and NASA itself, but oftentimes innovation can be very slow the bigger an organization gets. So the more the entrepreneurial environment is, is tapped for these technologies, um, the quicker you'll see the pace of innovation. And so for me, that's the really exciting part about what's happening right now. And also when you look at commercial uh, crew, commercial cargo, having multiple suppliers, having multiple people innovate on these technologies um, just gets us to that goal faster. So the more companies, the more um, NASA programs and NASA funding we have, the faster we can get there and the more technologies we can create and the more robust technology portfolio we'll have because you can have multiple technologies coming from multiple places to solve the same problem. What I wanted to say about that is we have to work on the reliability of all the technologies that keep our astronauts alive. We have a lot of work that we've done on, say, water recovery. Uh, we have to make sure that that is long-term stable and reliable. And then also, um, as Tony mentioned, we need that reliable means of transportation to the moon or to Mars or wherever we go. As part of my job, part of my group, um, we tend to take our spacecraft usually to the Cape in Florida to launch it. And it's, it's a very big logistical problem to take all of our ground support equipment, all of our flight hardware, all of our people, all the way across the country. Now imagine that this much more difficult when you're launching all this stuff into space. For our case, how many tractor trailers do you need? What kind of special route are you going to take? All those overpasses, sometimes the trucks don't fit under those. Um, so you're looking at a logistical problem on that scale and multiplying it because of all the um, resources and the time it takes to prepare each launch that you're going to send into space. One thing I'll add to all that, Tony, Tony mentioned it earlier. We have to remember, a lot of you in this room who know this, but a lot of people don't know it. There were two failed attempts to land on the moon in the last year. Landing on the moon is not easy. So lander systems are critical to being able to actually accomplish anything we want to do. Okay. Um, so the next question that I have for you guys is, um, what scientific and commercial benefits do you think that settling on the moon 
and Mars will provide, and how do you think these will benefit and or uh, affect the life of You know, we mentioned uh, the our interplanetary missions as well, very critical part of our NASA portfolio. Um, solar cells, right? When you push the boundaries of solar cell efficiency um, at a company as big as Boeing, we also have pockets where this, these innovations really go out to market. For example, Spectralab is one of our companies, and that benefits life on Earth. You know, while well, I've always been just in awe of the relationships we have here at Rice and the Texas Medical Center for long-term sustainable uh, space flight from a human perspective and the human interaction perspective. Um, the technologies that we work with on the International Space Station, you know, my team of engineers every day creates the uh, box, if you will, that uh, experimenters can take their technologies, their uh, medical experiments, and their uh, external payload type uh, uh, material type experiments to the International Space Station, and that makes our life lighter, that makes our life simpler, that makes our life faster. Uh, back here on Earth, and uh, you see that, I see it more tactically from a human spaceflight targeted mindset, but then you see that at a macro level with those that are launching satellites right now to expand uh, internet, for example, right? So it, it, it works both ways on the benefits of pushing that envelope uh, for the benefit of all humankind. The way I like to think about this, and uh, I think kind of probably one of the um, best recent historical um, comparisons would be the settling of the American West, right? Um, I imagine most of you went to high school in the United States and learned some U.S. history, maybe you remember the big thing, uh, even before the gold rush, the American government was pushing out to settle the West. And the way that this typically happened is that a fort would be built, a U.S. government fort. And then what happens is what naturally, the naturally, natural evolution of this is that you start to get traders hanging out at that port, at, at, that, at that location. And then you start to see little villages pop up around the fort. And then all of a sudden you've got an economic system. And, and you then you take a picture of a fort on the American West, and 100 years later, it's a little museum with skyscrapers all around it, right? And that's how most of these Western cities were formed. And so um, we expect something similar to happen on the moon, right? Once the U.S. is there, once that first fort is established, there's a place to go, there's a place to do business, then the economics will grow from there. And so I think what you're seeing with the Artemis program is the beginning of an entirely new economic system um, that will uh, create an off-world um, economy that we can all benefit from. And just like with the settling of the new, new world and, this, um, and the settling of the American West, the benefits that come back to the home world are not what you expect, right? Um, they didn't expect gold from the American West. They didn't expect um, the, how, how, uh, how much people could make off of furs and trading furs when, when um, they were originally settling the Northeast United States. So we don't know what that big, um, that big product is going to be. Um, but it's going to be very interesting to find out. So I, I, I like Megan's example. <clears throat> Turns out Apollo wasn't much of a fort, was it? <laughs> um, and that's why we are where we are today. Exactly right. Right. Yeah. So, so it, it's clear we need a different approach towards doing business in space if we want to create the economics that have a long-term sustainable effect. Um, NASA has to look at these kinds of the differences, uh, these kinds of systems differently. We need to partner with industry differently. We need to talk about the mechanism differently. We need a much broader um, swath of civilization to participate and benefit from it. Uh, I think Megan's exactly right. The benefits you get back generally aren't necessarily the things you thought you were starting out to look for. But, but history has taught us very clearly that the benefits emerge, and they, the people who are prepared to take advantage of that are the ones that get the, the net effect. I think the other thing that we can gain commercially is that as we explore the solar system more and discover more about other planets, we may also learn more about our own. Because sometimes certain things are, might not be obvious because we've been dealing with our own geology for so long, but when we look at a different planet, oh, is this how this, how this uh, developed? Or are there other minerals or whatever that you find here? Maybe we have other places to look on our planet for stuff like that. Um. Do you think, as climate change worsens, the push for settling on other planets, like Mars, because everyone keeps talking about dead Mars, would you think that would become more stronger, like the urge to settle there? 
and just like that. Two thoughts. First off, it's almost assuredly easier to clean our current planet than to get to Mars. <laughs> At least in scale and in a way that would represent change. But here's a thought I will give you. The kinds of problems we have to solve to keep humans in space alive for long spans of time, you've mentioned some of this already, are very similar to the kinds of problems we need to solve on this planet to handle some of the climate control problems and other, the other problems associated with waste and, and sustainability. I agree with that. If uh, certain people were trying to, say, terraform Mars, the, the methods by which you would go about that would be ways that we could, say, keep uh, the ocean from inundating coastlines if we were motivated to do so on Earth. I don't, I don't think that, there's, as, as he said, there, it's way easier to clean this planet than to fix another one. Mars is a real fixer-upper, okay? <laughs> um, but I do think that you are going to see space as a place of business and a place of research fundamentally change how we look at climate change and, and possibly even offer some solutions. Um, I think that obviously what we know about climate change, all of that data comes from satellites. Um, and I think that um, over the coming years you'll see that it increasingly become a way that we both monitor and help mitigate climate change. You know, as a builder of systems, uh, whether for space or for air travel or personal mobility, um, as a tactical thinker, as an engineer through and through, um, when you look at the way you manage space, the way you manage risk, the risk and reward of, of what's the big word being our Earth is our Earth, um, and pushing the boundaries of human space life, knowledge, interaction in a hostile location, right, has a direct benefit to industries across the board. Whether you take the mentality of NASA's risk and, and management style over to uh, energy systems, whether you take the uh, technologies that you build for human rated spacecraft or long term solar power needs or things that are 100% sustainable solutions in any X category you can pick and give it over to the mining industry or give it over to uh, systems engineering approaches for logistics. All of that is for the benefit of Earth, and I think that's also a secondary impact of what you're seeing with these investments for deep space, is that it impacts other industries back home to be more efficient, and efficiency helps the bottom line, but more importantly, as we all get older, you see these macro forces of what is a good company, a company also makes life better on Earth um, as a result of this far forward thinking uh, with NASA as a, as a leader there. And I do want to say one more thing. We've got to give a shout out to Jeff Bezos real quick because a big part of his solution here is if you take all of that industrial mining, uh, the industrial activity, all that nasty, dirty stuff that's hurting our environment, and if you start doing that off world, um, that prevents a lot of the, the problems from starting in the first place. So, um, asteroid mining, it's a thing. <laughs> Um, what do you think are the toughest challenges we will have to overcome to create a sustainable human space program? For example, for humans living and working in space in the ISS or the moon or maybe Mars or beyond. You know, the obvious place to start, Mark already mentioned it and somebody asked me a question about it. It's it really <clears throat> a discussion of alignment of priorities uh, at, the, at the national level and at the company level. Um, Space is not for the faint-hearted. It's not for the people who've got a little bit of money. <laughs> there used to be a long joke a long time ago, if you want to make a small fortune in space, start out with a big one. <laughs> um, but we're no longer in an environment, I would argue, and we, some of the other panels might want to join in this discussion some, it isn't a technological question so much anymore, uh, particularly a lot in lower form, okay? There are some challenges as you get further out into space, particularly with humans. But it's now more a discussion of aligning priorities and of finding the objectives that get groups of people to get their interests synced up. And that turns out to be one of the more harder things humans can do, right? Just watch the way our national discourse is going these days. Getting people to agree on things is hard. It isn't so much technology anymore. Now it's getting everybody to agree on what the right objectives are and agreeing to move them the same way. I agree 100%. You know, a lot of the people in this room have contributed significantly to solving those technological problems and um, every technological program, problem we come up against as a country we find a solution for. I'm not worried about the technical side. I'm worried about the funding side. Um, NASA funding going up lately has been absolutely fantastic and that's a big help. 
Um, but if we want permanent human settlement, that's only going to happen with the power of, of a free market economy. That's the only way you get that long-term permanent settlement. There has to be an economic value to it. Um, you know, we talk about the Apollo program as what we got from that was flags and footprints, right? Because it wasn't really a fort. You didn't stay. Um, and so this time we go to stay and to build that economic system. And that is going to be the key that gets us to permanence. You know, uh, first and foremost, uh, you can have three variables like any good engineer, right? Political force, uh, technical force, economic force. And I think um, when we look at the opportunity of what the National Space Council has done, both as an American leadership perspective from a geopolitical standpoint in terms of deregulation to open up the aperture for, for opportunity of investment, and then as a leadership role for this country and NASA being just a tremendous resource for that. You see that in the last, you know, uh, over more than 30 years uh, ago with the International Space Station as a rallying point uh, geopolitically and then overall sustainability and then forward thinking in terms of what we can do and work on in space um, to create a, a lasting laboratory, a laboratory that over time is commercializing itself and creating those economic forces that will create that sustainability for the long term. I think is critically important. I think I'll give you my own personal example of having worked on the shuttle program you know, I was 18 when I was in the mission evaluation room working in the mission propulsion integration team. And the last shuttle landing was one of the toughest moments I will never forget in my life. Where we had this amazing technical workforce and it was the end of a program. And to have to come through that cycle, come on the backside and see the tremendous opportunity that exists in just 15 years of my career of commercial crew, of uh, the space station as a commercialization element, as the space launch system in this great commercial uh, uh, and, and integrated strategy for the moon and onward to Mars is the most exciting era I've ever seen. And I'm seeing talent that may have you know, taken a break for about three to five years because of the economic forces all coming back for the force of the greater good. Going through that and cherishing and understanding those tough moments and are the fuel necessary to take us forward. And so those are stories that as I look at this industry, those that have been through all of that is something I cherish and it helps provide that perspective for those who are investing in this new era of human space flight. I agree that we all have to come together around one priority that we're going forward and where we're going forward to. Um, it is uh, encouraging to me though that in general public opinion of NASA is very positive. People are very excited about space. Um, some people think we are much more highly funded than we actually are, um, so sometimes we need to uh, let them know exactly where our national priorities are so that they can tell their representatives or their senators that, you know, we actually want more going toward this, this cool space stuff. Um, how much collaboration between the public and the private sectors do you think will occur when it comes to the setting? So yeah, this, this goes back to my example earlier. I think that you have to have both. Criti both are critical if you want to have sustainability. Um, you know, the US government is not gonna continue to pay for a moon base forever, for, especially as we start to move on to Mars. Um, and so I think a great example of this, and I'll go ahead and plug one of my portfolio companies because, you know, that's what I do. Um, so a company that's actually, uh, they'll be here today, Axiom Space, they're based here in Houston. Um, and they're building the commercial successor to the International Space Station. So as we um, move towards retirement of ISS probably in the next decade or so, um, there will be a completely commercial space station to replace it. And that's the sort of um, idea and mentality that we need to have as we keep moving further out. Um, that you know the U.S. government and other governments are great to go and, and build that first fort and plant that first flag. And then how do we work together um, towards the same goals of turning that over to um, to a commercially sustainable um, environment? Megan is right. A lot of times when the economic benefit or payoff of something isn't immediately clear, um, but say the scientific value is, it really helps when the government kickstarts that by saying, we believe in this, we're going to give you the seed funding and you're going to get started. And then once it starts to become, people realize that this is actually going to work or that they can make stuff off of this, then they start jumping in and then we're going to have a very good collaboration there. 
the, the part of this represents a pretty big sea change in the way NASA looks at doing things, right? If you go back to the Apollo era, or even all the way through shuttle and station era, NASA guided the, you know, we didn't actually build the hardware. I mean, most of you probably know this, NASA doesn't actually build a whole lot of hardware itself, okay? We, we, we give a lot of money to people like Boeing and Lockheed to build hardware for us. Um, but NASA tends to guide the development, they, they define the requirements, they, they tell people what to build, they essentially do everything except actually build the hardware. That doesn't necessarily create the kind of sustainable ecosystem that Megan's talking about. You need a very different approach towards creating a robust, vibrant economy that doesn't depend upon just NASA money to keep it flowing. So we're seeing NASA actually change. The program I'm running is trying to do that for lunar services. Now, bear in mind, not very many countries have landed on the moon yet, and yet we're going to try and get two small companies to do it in really less than a year from now, uh, maybe a year to a year and a half from now at the most. Um, and we're going to do it without NASA defining requirements, without NASA telling them how to build the lander. Basically, we're just going to hand them a payload and say, call us when it's on the moon, guys. So they have to figure all that out on their own. Now, you can, make, you can have a debate about whether that goes too far and doesn't give enough help. And we'll kind of see how the results play that out. Commercial crew, commercial cargo, commercial lunar payload services, all of them represent somewhat different touch points, but they all have a similar theme. NASA's looking for the right way to engage in creating a sustainable economic infrastructure. Because the engine that drives this can't be government funding. It has to be a broader free enterprise market that drives all that. And when I think about, as I said earlier, about working across a portfolio, I have basically two very large uh, teams working on two very different sides of that same uh, argument. You know, number one, on the commercial crew side, uh, the requirements are provided by NASA at a top level, and then you go innovate, you go do, and do it in a way that's uh, low cost and sustainable from an economic perspective under the rules of the commercial crew program, per se, the goals of the commercial crew program. And then you flip over over on the SLS side, the Artemis rocket, and really pushing the boundaries of technologies and needs that you have to have to go around the, the lunar um, environment, and HRO orbits, the gateway ecosystem, and then landing the first woman on the moon. And so uh, it really is different. It's been, a, honestly, personally, a, a pleasure to work on both sides because you understand both the risks uh, and the what some, some people might say a more serious approach to development, but it's also a representation of the difference between working on one side on a more commercially minded mindset and then the tougher side, which is you're developing, you're paving, you're clearing out the, the, the trees to be able to pave the road. And then at some point, a commercial crew-like program comes around, and then you're managing the toll road uh, between two centers of economies. Um, and so those, those at, at the large organizations that have been around since the inception of NASA, is where you kind of get both sides. And both influencers, whether you're on the entrepreneurial side or on the more traditional side, are good experiences to have when you're working on these long-term cycle businesses. Okay, and one more question that I have for you guys before we open the questions to the audience. Um, do you have any advice for students looking to work in the space industry? And what do you look for these students who want to work and get involved with your companies and organizations? So, yeah. I'll start this one. Let me take a quick poll. Um, how many of you are engineering students? Okay. Um, <laughs> how many of you are math, finance, economics? Okay, we've got a couple. Um, science. There we go, there's the rest of them, okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, I would say, you know, for, for the major, for almost any job, for almost any position, it's about who you know, right? Very rarely do people just get a job because they put in an application on a website. And the thing that was the most influential for me when I first started getting into this industry was volunteering volunteering with organizations that had like-minded people, right? Um, and so for me, that was a group called the Space Frontier Foundation. That's all about using the power of free enterprise to lift humanity permanently off the world. And that resonated with me, being a finance and economics person, and so I started volunteering at their conferences. Um, next thing you know, I met the founder of that organization. That person is now my business partner 10 years later. Um, so it all goes back to that first decision to, to, to volunteer at that conference. And that's you know, how I built my network out that has helped me be very successful in my career. So if uh, Space Frontier Foundation sounds interesting to you, let me know. Um, also, there's a great conference that happens in Austin every year that I'm part of called the New Worlds Conference. 
Um, and that's looking very far out. A lot of the questions that we were talking about here today are the types of things that are talked about at that conference. Um, it's about settlement of new worlds. Um, and that's in Austin every November. Great networking opportunity. Um, if you're interested in either of those, please come see me at the, uh, at the reception, and I'm happy to get you involved. So, so I would suggest students today have some opportunities that weren't around when I graduated from college. Um, if you wanted to work in the space business when I graduated, it was NASA or Boeing or well, Lockheed, people like that. Donald Douglas was still around back then. But, but there is a large number of small new space companies out there. You all should be paying attention to them. That's where a lot of the interesting, exciting, innovative work is happening. It's also where opportunity is going to emerge. Don't get me wrong, it's fine to work for NASA, it's great to work for the big companies too. We all need more engineers, that's not a problem. But you all will have opportunities to work in a much wider range of environments for a much more diverse community of companies than was true a few years back. That's a great point, Chris, and I'd just like to point out that the Space Frontier Foundation's annual conference is called New Space, um, and it's one of the larger gatherings of those new space companies. One more time, I'm done. <laughs> We are New Space 2, let's put that on the record here. Uh, when I joined the Boeing company 15 years ago, yeah, it was kind of the, the back end of that cycle uh, working on traditional, what some people could call a traditional human spaceflight program. Today, it is a whole new world order, and that is something that you don't know when you apply to one of the big companies when you come in. Um, we have a, an investment arm of Boeing Horizon X looking at companies that are on the entrepreneurial side to be able to work with and bring the knowledge capital that comes with working in this human spaceflight business. We uh, invested recently with, um, uh, I believe it was Virgin Galactic, um, in terms of creating the ecosystem of which it would operate in the future um, opportunities of uh, suborbital human spaceflight. And at the same time, I have to turn around and then go speak on the far edge of the NASA investment team in the uh, multi-country uh, approaches of the International Space Station and the Space Launch System. As a mechanical engineer having to come in, turning into a systems engineer, propulsion engineer, then transitioning over to a human factors engineer, and then turning that leaf over um, and, and getting the perspectives from crew like Nicole Mann, like Mike Fink, like astronaut Chris Ferguson, and then flipping that over and then speaking about the investment opportunities and long-range business plans and the long-range investment necessary in partnership with NASA to go make these giant leaps happen. That is my day in, a, in an hour, in a two hours. And so when I think about what it takes to come into this industry, number one, never lose, my first boss said it, never lose it. A, number one, a curiosity and a spark to go learn. It doesn't end when you walk across the stage at Rice. Two, the people in the network, both from a historical perspective, because that is so integral in terms of the North Star of what we are all doing here. And then, and then third, uh, go, Vote. Go understand the environment in which you're working in as an engineer. You do not know how important your voice is as a technical individual in this community to help drive what we're all looking and going to, and most importantly, understand the forces at play um, in terms of creating this green soil which we're going to go plant, this amazing tree for all of humanity. Um, I love what I do every single day. We are always hiring, and I can absolutely talk about to, uh, to you about all the places we work and play from Silicon Valley all the way to the Space Coast? I would say in general, just be persistent for everything. I have a lot of colleagues who've said they've tried to get into JPL several times before it actually worked out for them, but there they are now. Um, and I guess my plug for JPL, our summer internship program also has several hundred people in it, and the application deadline is the end of March. Um, so you do still have time to do that. Um, and also, if you're interested in space, definitely apply to all the space companies, all the small space companies, as Chris mentioned. But don't limit your search there, because it doesn't hurt you to have, say, experience in an oil company or experience being an engineer in a, in a uh, car company and then transfer into space. That doesn't rule you out. So it's actually, in my personal opinion, better to have some level of experience in something even if it's not space. Okay, thank you so much. And now we open the questions to the audience. Yes, yes. 
So when you look around um, at the uh, progress of commercial companies in the space industry, it looks a lot like the emergence of you know, commercial airliners um, way back in you know, the 1920s. How do you see the development of the commercial space industry progressing, uh, maybe along those lines or um, along a different lines? The question was the similarities to the emergence of the airline industry in the 1920s. What a lot of people don't know about the airline industry is that what made it profitable, what made it actually happen, was the U.S. government gave several of the airlines contracts for mail delivery, right? Airmail, right? That, that was what supported the airlines until people were confident enough to actually get on that scary thing in the sky and take off the ground, right? Um, and so that's exactly what you're seeing here, right? With NASA buying um, rides to the space station for both cargo and crew, um, they're becoming that anchor customer that's allowing SpaceX and Boeing to develop these, um, these commercial systems that will have tourists flying on them within the next year to 18 months. Um, so it's, it is very similar, and, and the anchor government customer and, and not so much, you know, government grants and government funding, that's all great and wonderful and, and great for startups, but it's having that consistent customer that just pays for a service um, and isn't in the middle like we were talking about. It's not, um, you know, issuing a whole bunch of requirements. The government's just paying for a service. And that's how you get an industry like this started. This is more a question directed at Chris Amy, but uh, what do you see as NASA's project management and sort of building a market, as you were saying before, where there's still room for technological development, or just how does that sort of line between private industry and public um, money play out? Well, um, my opinion is that yes, NASA is does have to start the market, as Megan and, and Chris mentioned, um, but I think there will be some level of picking and choosing between what NASA does personally, personally, and uh, what they farm out to contractor companies. Um, for example, with JPL, we tend to do one-offs. Um, that's not technically true for everything. We do sometimes do a couple of things, but in general, we, we are not a production house. We don't build 20 satellites of the same thing and send them all out there. So we're trying to be trailblazers where we do some of the newer stuff and then I think our perspective is that other companies could come in and take in some, some of that technology and do more St. Mars rovers later on. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I think, I think a couple of things will emerge over time. One, rarely do companies invest in pushing the boundaries of technology way past where it's necessary to accomplish, you know, they're essentially facilitating the current market. So government investment to push technologies forward so that industry that follows are actually very critical. I also think it's unlikely you'll see the companies take some big risks flying humans to Mars, other than, other than Elon, maybe Elon will do it, but other than Elon, there aren't a whole lot of companies willing to take that level of risk because the level of investment is so large. Um, I'm going to talk about SLS. SLS is a good example of really pushing the boundaries of launch capabilities well past what the commercial market needs to put small stuff into low Earth orbit. So that kind of government investment seems highly likely, and that's where I think you'll see places like NASA pushing down the road. But we, if we're doing things well, we're turning it over to the commercial side more rapidly than we've done in our past. Um, um, what kind of do you propose to the technology that might end up on Mars by the climate and space weather that occurs on the surface of Mars? Okay, so let me uh, the challenge is essentially the, 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 the space weather, the environment of Mars, and what, what challenges that poses to the people in particular? Yeah, in the technology. Okay. Yeah, so, so let's start with the big one, radiation. Okay, we take for granted that radiation protection because of our atmosphere and the magnetic belts around Earth protect us in ways that you aren't protected if you go into deep space. And that applies not just to humans, but to hardware as well. Now we're doing a little better job at handling how the hardware can be protected. You wrap the hardware in enough lead, it's reasonably well protected. But that's hard to wrap humans in enough lead to make them protected. So, so radiation protection in particular is one of the things we've spent a lot of energy trying to understand. And part of the problem is we don't really know a lot about it. You can't experience it on Earth. And for some, some reason, we aren't allowed to expose humans you know, in, in nuclear reactors to these kinds of things. But, um, so, so finding solutions to those kinds of problems, which are inherent in the space environment, I think is one of the big ones.
We also have a definite temperature problem on Mars. Um, the temperature between midday and nighttime is very extreme. Um, and so you have to make sure that you don't have, say, temper temperature differentials between the different materials in your habitat because you don't want certain things to shrink or grow in ways that they won't stay together. Um, Mars also has not much of an atmosphere. It's about 1% of the density of Earth's, um, which is interesting, right? The moon doesn't really have much of an atmosphere, so you couldn't actually fly a helicopter on the moon. Uh, you can fly one on Mars, but the Martian atmosphere we say it's not that it's not enough to really slow down a spacecraft that's coming into land, but it's enough that it's a problem and you have to deal with the heating. That's why we have to have the heat shield on the rover when it's coming in, because just like when you're landing on Earth, you get that friction heating. Um, so you have to be able to deal with that atmosphere. It's also uh, the base um, gas is CO2, unlike the nitrogen that we have on Earth. So obviously, you know, you're going to have to deal with pressurizing your habitats, your suits, and all that stuff. And now you have marching dust everywhere. Um, it blows a little bit, probably not enough to really be blowing things over, unlike a certain movie we can all remember. Um, but enough to get it everywhere. And if you are um, moving things and dust, don't really go together very well. So you have to know how to seal things and keep it clean um, and not get all that Martian regolith inside your habitats. We have one more question. Uh, earlier on, there was uh, a question of uh, how space technology can help us with environmental concerns on Earth. Recently, the European Space Agency shut down a large number of methane emissions in the early basins in the oil and gas industry with a couple of satellites. NASA operates a lot of Earth surveillance satellites. Can we expect that kind of behavior from NASA too? Um, let's see. The, the first off, the simple answer is I don't think we know. Um, NASA had, there's actually a fun video that goes around, and I don't know how many people have seen it, that asks, you know, which, which planet has studied, NASA studied more than any other planet in the solar system? And it turns out the answer is Earth. So we, do a, we actually spend more money on Earth observation than we do on any other planet. Um, and, and obviously we're a part of the political infrastructure of the country, so we're driven by things that, that, that have um, resonance at the political level, you know, both the White House and Congress. But NASA's budget for Earth observation has stayed pretty steady for many, many years. Um, like other parts of NASA, it doesn't show massive growth, but it has stayed steady. The harder discussion on all these things is reaching the consensus on what the right measurements to take are. And, and you know, when, when it's fairly easy to define 17 missions that would help us better understand what's happening to Earth's climate, for example. But we've only got funding to do two of them. And, and so it really isn't. I, from my personal opinion, I haven't seen a lot of evidence that NASA is being pushed away from that kind of work. I think we're still spending as heavily as we have in the past. Um, but it is very hard to reach consensus on what the right missions are within the budgets available to us.
it'll be tough, really tough. But we have the right people for the job. We have pressed the qualities for success in a system after system. This country of the United States was not built by those waiting and resting. Pushed our people past every failure we can bring up. We have never been more ready to meet the unknown. Get engineers that solve problems, 
get to do it with really interesting people that are like-minded. But I really like the last panel because a lot of it was business. All of this is only there because of what it'll do to drive the economy. And if you think about it, we talked about the uh, airmail. Uh, so if you, other stories, you know, the Mayflower leaving Europe, uh, Transcontinental Railroad, this is not a new model. It's really gonna go somewhere. And I just feel really fortunate to be part of it at a point where it's really gonna change. NASA, I think, has had a few fits and starts, right? I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but I think we only went to the moon to prove we were better than somebody else. Now it's because we're gonna lead the country, lead the, lead the, lead the world, Mark, Mark talked about it. We can put all the steps going forward and make all of this happen and things will follow. I was dying for you guys in the last panel to say something about GPS. <laughs> Designed to be a navigation aid. Look what it's used for now. That's what's going to happen. We're going to develop things and smart people are going to spin off and do other things with it. Silicon Valley exists, I think, because we needed high-speed computation. Look at that's booming. So I feel so lucky to be part of this at a time when it's really going to happen. The Congress, the President now all really get it. They're aligned. And we're going to move forward. Not too, excuse me, not too fast because we don't want to spend too much money. It's very precious. But we'll move forward methodically. And uh, Presidents have been shown to change their mind when they make a decision. And I think that's where there's a real future in what's going on in space. So it's really encouraging to see so much excitement. And what I always say is, you know, we are just a bunch of nerds building cool machines, but it is really going to change the world. Thank you. I'm um, David Alexander. I'm a professor here at Rice. I, don't, I know many of you, and uh, I'm currently the director of the Rice Space Institute. Um, I can say lots of stuff about our students, um, but hopefully the folks from the companies here will get to see that for themselves a little bit later. Um, I used to work at Lockheed Martin, um, different division. Um, to Larry, but I was at the Advanced Technology Center in California. Um, and one of the things that I really learned from that, I'm a scientist, astrophysics, I could not care less about big pointy things that have flames coming out of the bottom. At least, at, least, at least I used to say that until I moved to Houston. But the key thing I learned working, we were building robotic missions to study the sun, so the human aspect wasn't part of what we did. But the key part was, uh, and many of you have heard me say this, is that the scientists and the engineers working and the, the joke I tell, which is actually a kind of true version of what happens, is the scientists go in and tell the engineers what they want to do. And then once the engineers stop laughing, they tell the scientists what they can do. And it's that combination of the practicality with the, the exploration uh, side. And when everybody's on the same page, the engineers and the scientists plus the business people and the, the government organizations, that's when you can make a huge difference. And I think we see Houston's particularly uh, blessed in that with regard to the kind of people we have here. Um, and so one of my jobs is to sort of try and make those connections to NASA centers around the country, but also to international uh, centers around the world. And maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit on, on that as we go. And I think being in Houston, you can't talk about space without the human aspect. And I think we'll see a lot of that in, in discussion to follow. So thank you. All right. Thank you, panelists. Um, so the first question I'm going to throw to Mark. Uh, the question is, what is a question that you wish somebody would ask you? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and here's the question. What the heck is NASA doing today and why? Uh, I've done so many different things at NASA. I've been so fortunate over a very long time, 52 years now. Uh, one of the things I've done, curiously, as a side venture, was work with themed attraction business. Uh, designing theme parks and space theme attracts. I've learned from them the power of what they call narrative. It's extremely powerful. And if I look at human spaceflight at NASA, uh, this is my take at our narrative and how it shaped what we've done. I think this shouldn't be surprised to many of you, but it may put it in language that's more helpful, on a concept that's more helpful. We were born in the 60s with a race to the moon. And the goal there was not science, it wasn't technology, it wasn't anything, it was to beat the Soviet Union and win a battle in the Cold War, period. It was very difficult, and we did it. Having done that, the human spaceflight program almost frankly went away. In fact, I was fired. I was the last person hired at Johnson, and the Apollo program was fired at the end of it because I was the youngest person. Well, that was a real thing. Um, and NASA didn't go away, thankfully, and I think the leadership, well, you know, we've been to this place called space. What do we do there now? How do we learn to live and work there? How do we learn to use it? 
and that began to shape programs like the shuttle, Skylab, other programs. And it still exists, I think, human research. We're still learning about how to live and work in space and all as well. And at, in the 70s then, uh, as other countries began to have capabilities, and we wanted to express, I'll call it soft power, we wanted to lead with that soft power, the country got into international partnerships. And the first one was Apollo Soyuz in, in the early 70s, 73. And it grew to the Space Lab, showed the mirror of the International Space Lab. It's a great success. That's still going on, of course. Now what we have going on is, in the 2000s, it's, it's equivalent, really, as the U.S. looked at around what was happening in space, and it saw now it's not more countries that have space aspiration capable, it's more companies. And we want to support U.S. industry as they do that. So starting about 10 years ago, which commercial car commercial crew NASA began NASA. That's my story of the narrative layers of NASA human spaceflight and what it's done to give you a sense of perspective of 52 years of working on it. Um, about 10 years ago, because I, I can invite to speak a lot of places, schools, civic clubs, churches, business organizations, I began getting that message out, and no one knew it. It was very just out in public. People would, what the, we thought NASA was dying. What's going on here? And that uh, caused me to put together some material to help explain this approach, that no, NASA is evolving to the next, and it's still evolving, and it's the arc of NASA's story. It's extremely powerful. And what it, the narrative is, the exploration of all the space, basically SIDS. That's the narrative today. And that, that development is a key part of that. It right? is. It's more than exploration, it's development too. And you've heard the last panel talking about that in some detail. I couldn't agree more. What does that mean? And the, the next, I got one more chart here that I wanted to explain what I think by, I mean by exploration of all the space. NASA explores space. Uh, uses uh, human space exploration with, and leads it with commercial and international partners. That's NASA's job to explore space. Having done that, though, it then, in an innovative and new way, so that supports space's commercial development. And that's what NASA's wrestling with now. And then uses that development to advance exploration. So it's an engine moving out from Earth, in my mind. It's explore and develop. Absolutely. And, it, and uh, we, I just want to pause yeah. you. Okay. Sure. Um, I wanted to highlight, uh, I believe Dr. Chang is, is working on some technology for that mm -hmm. explicit purpose. Uh, would you like to talk about that? Uh, yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, th th there are two ingredients that I think are, um, that, that need to be looked at. And one is power and the other one is propulsion. Those are the two um, key elements that will enable this exploration and the development as well. And the, the power issue is obviously electricity. You know, electricity generation, power generation in space is changing the shape of the way commercial space is, is being done because we're moving from chemical propulsion to electric propulsion. And people keep talking more and more about high power electric propulsion and electric propulsion in the 60s um, was essentially at the level of one kilowatt, maybe. Now we're talking kilowatts to um, hundreds of kilowatts. And that changes the way, the, way the, 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 the business is carried out. Because now you can do more commercial work in the vicinity of Earth with um, propulsion systems that are far more efficient than the chemical rocket that we have. So this is an important one. And the other one that is, is very important that seems to be avoided or maybe discussed in a sort of a tangential way is uh, nuclear power. Nuclear power is an essential ingredient for us to truly move beyond the confines of Earth of the Earth environment, the Earth-Moon environment, nuclear, and I'm talking about nuclear, nuclear electricity, you know, nuclear electric propulsion, and that um, is an area that um, that we're missing, and people are afraid of it. There's been some sort of uh, sort of timid incursions in the field of nuclear thermal propulsion because we did it in the 60s. But it is a bit of a dead end, you know, 
because you don't get that much benefit from the use of nuclear uh, power for thermal propulsion. And so we need to take that bull by the horns and grab, grab it and deal with the problem of high power nuclear electric reactors for space. So those are the two pieces that I think is important to bring up. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to focus on the fact that we have an astronaut up here, and we also have somebody that works on the things that keep astronauts safe. And I was wondering um, if Mr. Price could talk about uh, some of the things that NASA is concerned about and companies like Lockheed Martin are concerned about when they design spacecraft for human beings, health-wise. So the, the previous panel touched on a lot of things, you know, so in, and Mark mentioned uh, bone loss, muscle loss, exercise, radiation protection. So what's really intriguing about uh, building the Orion spacecraft is to be able to support crew for extended periods of time in deep space. So it's all the protection things that we don't really know that much about already, and uh, uh, being able to have enough propulsion to get where you're going and back again, and everybody knows mass is king. You can't ever have as much weight as you'd like to have to do things. Wrapping humans in, in lead for radiation is not a, not a solution. Uh, so the di discussion uh, David had mentioned about uh, scientists coming up with a question and engineering, engineers solving the problems is trying to solve those problems on any, everything to keep a human alive for when we go to Mars years. And it's, it's really intriguing just what the electronics has to do. And we're not doing anything that's really extreme technology. Heat shields have been done before, electronics have been done before. But the quantity of software that's on the vehicle, to have it be autonomous and flown uh, by the astronauts or by the ground or autom uh, automatically, is really challenging and when things would break and what's going on for the last really decade to advance the hardware, the components, uh, even just plumbing. You know, propulsion is rocket science, but it's just valves and plumbing and to make these valves work and move the, uh, move the propellant around in the vehicle. Franklin is really right. What we need is a good propulsion system so it doesn't take so long to get anywhere. Um, we're just basically doing, you know, Chinese fireworks with chemical propulsion. And uh, when we went to Pluto, the spacecraft that went to Pluto was, I think I would say, the smallest spacecraft that they could make to do the science with the biggest rocket that existed. It left the Earth's atmosphere on its way to, to, uh, to Pluto. It took, what, three days to get to the moon. New Horizons passed the lunar orbit in nine hours. And then it still took it, what, nine years to get there. We need propulsion and not keep crew alive as long as it takes to keep them alive. But the Orion spacecraft is really a challenge for an engineer to package all the pieces in to solve all the problems, uh, business problems, but all of the human engineering, health sciences, communication. It's been a wonderful challenge. And if I can add in there, um, you know, on top of any additional uh, human health concern we may have, it's the ISS has been a wonderful test bed for learning more about health in space and how to keep people healthy. But it, we're in low Earth orbit. We can have communication in just a minute. We can have video with surgeons on the ground. If we need to bring crew back, it's three and a half hours from undocking the Soyuz to getting back down. As soon as we go out there, they're out there, and propulsion can help a lot with that to reduce that time. But still, if they're three months out, they're three months out there on their own. So trying to anticipate any problems and more so uh, getting the broad-based skills and broad-based design so that we haven't engineered individual solutions for individual problems but broad-based solutions for potential problems and make sure that their the crew will be as healthy as we can make sure of. Thank you. Um, so that was kind of uh, forward-looking to technologies that we're thinking about. Uh, what are technologies within the past five years that you think have revolutionized space flight? And I'll leave that open. Um, first, I'd like to just point out that scientists do not create all the problems and engineers have all the solutions. <laughs> um, but <laughs> they would like, the engineers would like to think that way about that. Um, no, I think, I think the thing that's, that's kind of revolutionized lately, I mean, apart from that, I mean, it's been the big push towards commercial um, and then the partnerships with NASA. 
Um, obviously, reusability is, uh, I think, uh, I don't think there's anybody in the room who's seen that double booster landing um, and not got excited about the space program. Um, I also think um, that the capability in smaller packages has come up. We, you know, the, the, the CubeSat uh, revolution is part of that. Um, and then I think there's a third piece, and that is the, the, uh, just the, the capability in, uh, uh, in the, uh, the computer systems, for example. Um, you, you all know the story about how the Apollo program kind of ran on something that was you know, significantly less powerful than your iPhone. But now, with all of this innovation, we're basically turning the iPhone revolution into a space revolution. We can reprocess spacecraft in six months. And so the next generation of spacecraft can go up in a shorter time scale. So that development phase is getting shorter. And as we translate that to the bigger items, um, that's, just, that's being translated over from the commercial companies working with NASA um, and putting all that together. So I think, I think those three things, there may be some others are very specific, but broadly speaking, the reusability, the, the smallness of the packages and the capability of those small packages kind of encompasses most of, I think, the big changes that have happened five to the last five or ten years or so. Just to add on that, just a little tiny bit, right? You mentioned Apollo and it's got what? That's um, 100k RAM of memory or so. The, Apollo, the Orion spacecraft has 3 million lines of software code between flight code, ground code, and, and simulation code. And what that vehicle can do and process and retain the capability with very small components in the radiation environment is really remarkable. Another future-looking question, uh, where do you think humans will be in 2050? On the moon, on Mars, further, still on Earth? <laughs> you know, I, I think the, that poses a question. It shouldn't be about where it's about what. What will they be doing? I think it's the key. Uh, ends and means are really important to differentiate. That's one thing I've encouraged to think about the ends. What are the ends of something that surely really means? We talk, we love destination of those rockets. Those are means. What's the end? It's more important. What's the end that's going to take us here? So that encourages thing about what we'll be doing on the moon and Mars or elsewhere. So I'm I'm really encouraged where NASA has come and the country has come and all the different types of programs in the last ten years really remarkably. And so I, I think we'll be past Mars and other planets and have permanent colonies on, on places like Mars. And I think what will really happen, what's, what's happened, I, I'm really interested in the last panel and all of the economic drivers that are going to come. That's what's really going to explode this. We don't use that term in space, but it's going to explode the market. And it, it will really drive it. And there's so many examples of where the government has planted a little bit of seed money, venture capital kind of thing, and then taken off. I, I don't know about asteroid mining, but evidently there's some asteroids that are like 90% nickel. And if you can capture the nickel and bring it back down to Earth, and it does not have a, a, a fluid value like gold, that you can consume all the nickel that you can provide. So things like that, some bright person will come up with a technique and it'll just take off. Uh, on that note, what role do you think, I probably heard this term thrown around, um, in situ resource utilization? Uh, do you think that there are any companies specifically that could develop a technology to say use resources on the moon or Mars to sustain human life? I mean, I think the, the, the most obvious one for that is water. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the South Pole is a strategic target. The, the Lunar Planetary Institute people in the audience would like us to visit many different parts of the moon for, for to basically to understand the moon. But from the point of view of ISRU, I think uh, water is the kind of primary. Whether you turn that into a nickel, nickel mining and so on, um, yeah, water is water, but it's also hydrogen and oxygen, both of which are rocket fuel. And so if you can actually provide that, if you can, and this is, a, this is a great opportunity, I think, and there's many different companies looking at this, particularly if you have NASA as an anchor tenant and you have that in space propulsion focus. Um, weight, mass is money uh, in the space industry, and so um, it, the, it, if you don't have to take it with you, um, it saves you a lot of money and you can then for buy it in there. So I think, I think that's an important aspect. Uh, as you think of a human exploration and whether there's a human presence on the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars, 
there's a different aspect to ISRU, which is uh, not necessarily for commercial sale, but to actually build stuff you need in situ. In other words, you can, uh, there's some experiments uh, with uh, um, some of the regolith in Hawaii, which simulate some, uh, very close to what's on Mars, uh, building concrete. And so you can actually build landing pads, uh, run road, roadways, etc., etc., robotically, presumably. And so just how much and what the innovation is um, really depends on, I think, your generation, really, is, is the, we, we, we should avoid focusing too much on the kind of things that, that Larry and others are doing because they're leading the way and they need to solve all these problems. Well, those problems are solved. You can start using those tools to do new stuff that we, can't, we haven't actually thought of yet. And ISRU is just sort of the, the raw materials to help you develop the, the ideas that uh, presumably there'll be a market for, whether it be a commercial hotel, if it was a Motel 8 on, on, uh, on, on the moon, or whether it happens to be a Lockheed Martin or, dare I say, Boeing. Um, <laughs> uh, doing other things in space. Um, and so I think that's, uh, I think it's just a very open environment, uh, just waiting for those ideas. Okay, we have about 10 or 15 minutes left, so I want to open it up to the audience for any questions. Um, I guess this is kind of uh, for the more technology side, but um, is there, because you said like how iPhones have revolutionized our current capabilities, um, with the advances of artificial intelligence, um, could you kind of remove part of the uh, human factor in like launches or transportation across the system? Or is that still too far? Let me take a shot at that at the beginning of it, right? So it's, it's happening right now everywhere, right? Um, one of the examples I love was when we flew the Orion uh, experimental test flight that you can watch on YouTube, Orion split screen. Um, one, the, one part of the vehicle that was not radiation hardened, was not space qualified, was cameras. And we wanted to have cameras on board because humans relate to what they can see, not all these lines of data coming back. And by the way, the cameras didn't work late in the program and we were scrambling around to get them to have the image right side up and in the frame. But when the cameras went through the Van Allen radiation belt, they upset. And you can see on the, on the YouTube video of these streaks that look, like cloud, that look like snow coming across the screen. Well, the Orion capsule is full of what's called fault detection, isolation, and recovery autonomous software. And the ground crew, the amazing NASA people, since I'm not NASA, Apollo 13 kind of mentality. When we went through the radiation belt, the cameras upset, shut down. The fault detection software cycled through its process auto automatically, turned the cameras back on, and they were back with us. We went through the radiation belt two more times. The second time it went through, the ground, re the ground controllers reset the cameras faster than the software did. But there is so much complexity in going on when you're coming into the atmosphere at 17,000 miles an hour. You can't process all of this this quickly. Although the vehicle is, so we've got three sets of, of, of computers that have self-checking pairs, so if any one of them, it knows if it's good or not. Then the fourth computer is a backup computer which is dissimilar, so you can't have a common mode failure. So different hardware, different software, different coding. Can't do everything, but it can do all the dynamic, complex modes of flight. And then the next backup is the astronauts can fly the vehicle. Now, the engineers don't think they really can, Franklin, but... <laughs> They do have a hand controller and they can fly it if you get to the final thing. But I think autonomy is, is really there. We can't do this complexity without it. Sorry. I'm not sure you're going there, but if you're flying, do we even have human space flight? Let's send uh, intelligent devices up. Is that part of your question? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the answer to that is then it's not human space flight. We need humans there to experience it, to share the experience with other humans back here on Earth, period. We can do a lot of using capabilities, but it's, the day we stop sending humans into space is the day we stop going into space, I think, really, as a species. Just a real quick one. I, I just, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I just love to death everything that he writes. One of the things I think he said was, uh, he doesn't recall a ticker tape parade for a robot yet. The only, the only thing I would add to that is, um, if you think about the architecture that we heard from uh, Mark Iyer this morning and some of the things that the other panel talked about, 
um, those habitats, the, the habitat spaces that uh, the Ashton Ross are going to inhabit, will not be crewed the whole time. And so they have to be autonomously driven, and that requires smart machines. It requires, whether it's just full, full fledged AI making decisions, or whether it's just looking for fault detection. You, do, you don't want a micrometeorite to puncture your habitat and not have anyone know about it and have all the oxygen kind of leak out before the astronauts get there on a four month trip to Mars. So this combination of the human spaceflight, how they're supported with autonomy and artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques, I think is, is going to be crucial. Um, and so it's a way of bringing those things together. Whether it ever handles launches, again, it's a level of precision that you have to worry about. Um, but I think a lot of these things are unavoidable. And I think when they can be used effectively for the mission, I think they will be used. Absolutely together. There are things that you could, you've got to do precursors with robots, send them ahead of time. All the discussion we had about atmosphere, temperature, radiation on Mars to be able to do that. What's been going on on Mars? I think that kind of the other direction, there's maybe an argument that we know more about Mars than we do about Antarctica because of what we're doing with the, around the surface of Mars. There are orbiters there, permanent presence, permanent presence of orbiters, communication satellites, the rovers on the surface that have lasted so long and what we've learned about them. It's really marvelous. And the, the two together, humans and, and the robotics operating together, is what's going to propel us into the future. They're absolutely mandatory together. <coughs> okay. And we just talked about the AI and robotic precursors of human missions. 
but we all know that uh, there will be a limited, a very limited human workforce uh, for the first, uh, the construction of the first human outposts. Uh, but so how do you envision like the human robotic collaboration um, in the uh, constructions of the first human outposts? Not just as precursors. So, so if I understand the question, I mean, just to shorten a little bit, is uh, you're going to need both, and how do you envisage these things working together? Um, there's many different ways that can happen. For example, if you have an, an intelligent system on a habitat that's empty, I go back to this comment I made earlier about it being crewed for only a short amount of time. Um, you can have it monitoring the environment and have a different kind of environment that is human ready or not human ready. Um, the spacecraft on the way taking the crew to that habitat can be monitoring the health of the crew remotely. And again, you can also think of fault detection as fault detection in humans. Are they stressed? Are they getting sick? Are they, are they cognitively impaired? Uh, astronauts are under an awful lot of stress and a lot of the things they do, the psychological stresses as well as physical stresses. That information can be transferred to the new system once you dock, and then it can be integrated and so they can actually have all that information coming from four months of space travel, and then therefore can monitor the individual astronauts um, directly, in a sense, so that each one, each human is very different. So you need that kind of level of interaction. Um, you need some of the autonomy that can be overridden. You don't, maybe some of you are too young to remember um, how 9000. Um, I tried to put in a proposal for this very thing and they, they wouldn't let me call it how 9000. Um, you, you want the human to be part of the hierarchy, the autonomous hierarchy, but you want them to be the supervisor. You want them to be called what's in, in, in autonomy, what the, a supervisory role, and so that has to switch over. But a lot of these tasks can be done routinely without the, the valuable human time. Uh, being uh, used up in that way. Um, they're going to go outside, they're going to be roving, they're going to be uh, doing EVAs. That system has to monitor the environment, the spacesuits have to monitor the environment, and feed that information back to the humans. So the haptic interfaces, the visual interfaces, the oral uh, interfaces, those are all forms of human systems interaction. Um, the old Apollo version of it was make sure that when you push the button, you push the right button and your big fat finger and your glove doesn't push the other button by mistake. <laughs> um, and so it's just a modern version of that kind of thing. And so you have to have them work together with, I think, the authority ultimately being in the human. Um, uh, but those are things that you have to be careful of because, uh, as Larry pointed out, not just in the radiation belt, but there's radiation environments on Mars that could do what they call single event upsets. And that's the kind of thing that you can't prepare for because you don't know how it's going to interact. You can be as radiation hard as you think you are, and you can minimize those effects. How, a, how, a, how an AI or how a robot responds to those kind of things can be very different from a human. And so they have to kind of learn from each other in that way. And there's lots more that we can talk about in that particular realm. If I can just add on the end of that, there's a good mention that you robots monitor to humans, but also the humans monitoring the robots as well. Every time the crew lands off the ISS, we have crew questions and we interview them about how their training was, how their software was, how their interactions. And we actively use that information to keep improving uh, the software that we update. So it's not like we'll just send out the robots and send out the people and we're done uh, as part of the ground control of the human robot interaction. I expect constant updates as we learn more out there. Okay, we have time for one more question. I saw your hand first. Yes, please. Uh, my question is on international cooperation. Uh, it's really a two-part question. Um, first of all, the first part would be for Dr. Chang to ask, you flew the first uh, shuttle Mir mission, and um, I think we've come a long way since the Cold War, and then eventually to uh, your era of uh, actually cooperating internationally. So I was wondering, what was your training like um, compared to an old world of each country must keep their own secrets. Uh, um, and to uh, when you are going through the training, where you have to do these international corporations with a former, uh, maybe quote unquote enemy. Um, and what, what's what's you wondering? What was that training like? And second part is for all the panelists. As we go forward um, in breaking down boundaries and going forward with international cooperation.
cooperation, what should our mentality be going uh, forward? Yeah, uh, this is a very, very important point. Um, it was hard. It, it was very difficult uh, when we got to uh, to Russia. Um, you know, it, it happened to be winter and it, it was very cold. And but I mean, the the, the, the mindset, the the, the psychological um, uh, chemistry was, was, was very cold. And in fact, we sat down along to ta uh, a table uh, with the Russians at one end and us at the other, and two, in two um, uh, interpreters. And basically, they, they said, you know, why are you here? You know, we, we don't want you. And we told them we don't want to be here either. <laughs> <laughs> but we were told that we had to do it. And they said, yeah, we were told we had to do it too. And, and so, I mean, it was a forced uh, marriage in a way, um, which turned out to be a very good a very good thing because we look at us to get, today we wouldn't be anywhere without uh, the help of uh, the Russians. So um, clearly, international collaboration uh, needs to go beyond just the words. You know, we have to really work at it. And you know now we have maybe a dozen countries that are participating, oh, but there are 180 or so more that uh, are not in the game. And you, know, you look at the people who are flying. I mean, you're missing 90% of the of the population of the, of the planet, and I think that that's a problem. Uh, and, and you know, it's, it's even difficult to even talk about China. We're not doing anything with China. Why? Um, that's wrong. We're not doing anything with India to speak of in human space flight. Why? That's wrong. So, I mean, there's a lot to be done, and it all looks great now, but there's a lot more work to be done. So, uh, you guys, uh, young people, you know, have a lot, of, a lot in front of you, to, a lot of barriers to overcome. Let me add what Franklin said, if I could. I started earlier, I went to Paula Soyuz. You talk about dislike both ways. It was horrible. I mean, it was, I can't go into how horrible it was. What I learned from that was, though, that the common passion of exploring space did with all those differences. It really did over time. So go for 30 years. Uh, Tom Stafford, who was the commander of Apollo Soyuz, when he was 71, he and his wife Linda adopted two teenage Russian boys because Alexei Leonov asked them to. Now that's a relationship, and it's based on the passion for space. So yeah, it's tough, it's really important, and we need to cooperate with everyone in this. The common passion for exploring space will make all those differences fade away. I've experienced it over time. It's amazing. And your generation knows that, I think, better than others. So use it. Everyone needs to cooperate in space. Um, in fact, one of my first um, jobs, the things I worked on out uh, straight after being hired, was on the automated transfer vehicle built by the European Space Agency. So we had a European vehicle docking to the Russian side of the space station carrying American cargo. So I was part of trilateral meetings between specifically French engineers, Russian engineers, and myself and another American engineer. And we all had that passion for space. I think probably tensions were not quite as high. Uh, but we all wanted the best uh, docking mechanisms for our focus, and we all wanted that to be the best. We were coming at best from very different angles, so we want. So there was distinct disagreements about how to do that. So we had to. Uh, one thing I, I emphasize part of my job is communication. We had to be able to say, okay, we're, there's a lot of circular argument. Let's define the best. Are we going for most efficient? Are we going for lightest? Are we going for easiest build? And helping burrow down from three distinct viewpoints, I think made those procedures and made that better than it ever could if just one of those positions that try to do it alone. And I completely agree that we are missing out on viewpoints right now and the greater amount of viewpoints we can get, the better products, the, the better space exploration will be for all of us. Yeah, let me reiterate that. I mean, it's, it's wonderful and engineers get to solve problems and they're the good hard things that scientists come up with to do and we can't think of on our own. But communication is vital. We are much smarter with multiple people. You all know how to do that. You're all doing things in school in small teams. The business aspects of it that Megan and others brought up is what's going to be the engine that drives all of this. And you guys, it's just a wonderful time to be involved. You're the age of people that are going to be landing on Mars. 
and solving the really tough problems and all of this stuff will be you know a century behind us and the future will be in front of us it's really exciting right now all right uh, we are out of time uh, we could we maybe get like 30 seconds to like one minute just final thoughts I'd like to have one especially for the group said uh, I worked on Apollo it was extremely difficult this is your Apollo it really is the exploration and development of space it's harder actually than Apollo I think in a lot of ways don't never let anybody tell you it wasn't and Apollo we had one of the great adventures we were the first ones to do it now think about that so when the previous generation you're a bunch of morons you can't do it you don't do it that way you have this amazing set of capabilities that have preceded you, which you need to use, and you are very thankful for them, I think. But in inventing the next, uh, how to explore, and to add the layer of development on top of that, it's huge. It's extremely difficult. Uh, using companies in different ways. And all the things Megan talked about, about the commercial development, that is really, really hard. It's really hard for NASA, it's really hard for companies. It's so exciting. And frankly, I think it'll have a greater impact on human history than Apollo. Apollo's getting somewhere. It's an amazing accomplishment. But we're talking about settling space. That is a huge accomplishment. That'll change the course of history in ways Apollo never did. And that's your challenge. It's really hard, but it's so, so important. And exploration and development of space is key. So it says it's key. So I think I really did say it before, business communication, working in teams, but the future is yours. It is, it's really exciting. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do anything. Male, female, age, whatever, just go try. And it will be exciting. Um, unless your professor is going to be home for today. Um, I, I want to go back. We're focused on this panel on obviously the human exploration we're going to Mars. But there's something that Chris said in the previous panel, which I think is, and, and actually opens it up to many more of you. Um, they will never build a spacesuit for me. I keep asking them, but it's $30 million they don't want to spend. Um, but the thing is that if you are uh, if you are trying to put those humans wherever they have to be in space, the problems and the challenges you have to these challenges you face and the problems you have to solve, there are seven and a half billion people on the planet who can benefit from those sustainability technologies, health technologies, all of these different things. And so your imagination should not be just focused on getting people to space and keeping them alive there. It should be how you can take those and solve problems here on the ground, whether it be climate problems, whether it be water reclamation problems, whether it be all these different things. It's a really broad landscape um, that pretty much anyone, I mean, I would say anyone can get involved with and in. Um, and you don't have to go to Mars to do it. All of you are here on a pretty nice Saturday afternoon because you chose to come here because you are passionate about space exploration. Uh, you have the opportunities now, as mentioned in the previous panel, we need a constant push to keep going out there. We need that interest to be there, not just for this core group in the room, but you can infect the people around you with the same positive passions for space and uh, to help draw them together with the communication team. What we learn out there will help us down here, and I think that will be a great movement forward. <coughs> I guess my, my feeling is that, um, you know, go, going to Mars is, is fundamentally different from going to the moon. And the, the same formula that took us to the moon doesn't work, doesn't work with Mars. And we need to think through this problem. The chemistry today is an international chemistry. It's different from the binary chemistry of the 60s, where there were only two players, and the rest of us were just mere spectators, you know, watching this, you know, two titans, you know, duking it out in, in, in the sky. Um, it is a different problem, different players. We need to be part of a team. We need to learn. Uh, I'm talking about the United States. We need to learn to be team players. And so, we, perhaps we could become the leaders, but to be the leader, you have to earn that rank. You cannot assume that you're going into this and you're just going to be the leader because, uh, you know, the, the Almighty just gave you that, that designation. You have to earn it and it's a different environment, different players, you have to be a team player. That's 
that's the way I, I feel. All right. Thank you. Please give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, we're going to change over. We're going to have another short video and have uh, Leila Labach uh, introduce our special guest speaker. Ignition sequence start. We have taken tremendous steps. We chose to come to the moon before this big day lab. We have achieved the earth-shaking, the breathtaking, the groundbreaking. Left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. It's time we take the next great leap. We're building the next chapter of American exploration. Returning to the moon to stay. So we can go beyond to Mars to expand what's possible and further our understanding. The architecture for these missions is already taking shape. We will go with new systems, bold designs, and a sustainable mission. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. We are going. We are training, testing, pressing our pioneering spirit into every component, defining our resolve with every line of code, and securing our success with every welcomed partnership. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. Because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. And because we stand on the shoulders of the giants to go farther than humanity has ever been. We will add our names to the roles of the greatest adventurers in history. Every day, every mission, we advance this goal. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. Mrs. Saunders has been a part of NASA since 1994. She has previously served as Associate Manager of the International Space Station, Associate Director of the Johnson Space Center, and Acting Deputy Director of the Johnson Space Center. In 2018, she was named NASA's Deputy Associate Administrator, in which she currently assists the Administrator and Senior Managers in implementing the agency's various functions, policies, and programs. She also chairs the NASA Mission Support Council. Ms. Saunders has received the Meritorious Presidential Rank Award, two NASA Outstanding Leadership Medals, a NASA Exceptional Service Medal, and a Silver Snoopy, to name only a few of her numerous honors. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ms. Melanie Saunders to the podium. So sorry for that. I realize I'm staying between you guys in the networking reception, so I'm not going to talk for very long. Um, my uh, uh, boss, Jim Bridenstine, sends his regards. He wanted to come here personally. As you know, he was a rice owl, and so very close ties to rice, but he uh, unfortunately could not escape Washington today. So who's moving the charts forward? So I know that um, Mark Geyer talked to you a little bit this morning about um, how we're going to space, what some of our current plans are, the architecture, um, how we're going back to the moon and Mars and the two phases of the program. What I wanted to talk to you about is a little bit more of the why we're going, why it matters, and why, why you should care. 
So it's only one chart. I'm going to talk through this not in order, but um, anyway. So so why go to the moon? Um, there's some practical reasons. They talked a little bit about it. Some of the folks on the previous panel talked about the fact that um, you know we've been in with humans. We went yes, we went to the moon in the 1970s and 60s and 70s, but we have been in low Earth orbit with people ever since. And so there's a very practical reason. Uh, I'll tell you, I worked on the space station program for 15 years, and that life support, and then at the at the Johnson Space, uh, space Center for years afterwards, sitting through FRRs, flight readiness reviews for each of the the space uh, the space station increments, the life support was often a topic of of, of discussion. Really, really hard to do close loop life support. We went and benchmarked every place we could, but it's still fiddly. And I, frankly, you know, right now, astronauts can get from Earth to the space station on the Soyuz in about six hours. It takes about three hours. When Christiane Cook uh, came home from the space station recently, she, you know, they punched away from the space station. About three hours later, she was on Earth. Now she was on Earth in Kazakhstan, and so she had another 24 hours before she got back to our area. But three hours to safety. So. Um, space is a very, very unforgiving environment, and before we start going to Mars, which is really, really much harder than most people appreciate, we need to go back to the moon, we need to get a little bit more used to being days away, a, 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 an operational step away. We won't have mission control doing as many things uh, for the crew as they do on the space station, where they have a lot of good real-time um, communication, so we need to develop procedures and, and patterns and policies and habits for more autonomous work by the crew. So there's some really practical matters um, that keep us um, there um, uh, doing that. So, sorry, I used my phone for my notes, which was not a good plan, because my screensaver that NASA makes me have um, uh, takes it down. So. Um, Let's talk about a little for a minute about some of the broader context. So, in my lifetime, um, there were a number of uh, events that I think everybody, like kind of everybody my age, all experienced things where you remember exactly where you were and what you were doing. These are sort of life moments that are the most impactful things. There, think about in your life. There's not very many things where probably everybody that you know or meet or talk to, a stranger in the airport, somebody. Uh, in, in your classroom, somebody in your apartment complex or your dorm, though there are going to be, in your lifetime, there will be moments that everybody, everybody shared. Uh, in my lifetime, that was the Kennedy assassination. I was a small child, but that was the Kennedy assassination. The next one was the moon landing. The next one was the Challenger, the, shuttle, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploding in 1986. And the other one that I think rises to that level is 9 11. You might think it's weird for me not to mention Columbia, but because um, I was at Johnson when Columbia occurred, a terrible, terrible tragedy, but I think the fact that it was not the first time there had been a shuttle and it was on descent instead of ascent where everybody could see it happening on live national TV or world TV uh, made, made the difference here. But of those events, the only one that's positive, the only one that has any sort of positive association, and it was overwhelmingly positive, was the moon landing. That's why space exploration matters. There's a chance to make a positive, a positive moment in an entire generation or multiple generations lifetime that has something positive that we all share. That's tremendously important, that's tremendously inspiring, and it's tremendously um, uh, you know, helpful. So the way I look at what we're doing with going back to the moon, so what's gonna be that, what's gonna be that, that those moments, some of those moments are the, at least maybe the one positive moment for your generation. I think it will be when we land on the moon again, and I think it will be especially when we set first, the first have the first human set foot on Mars. So you guys can be part of that. There will be plenty of awful moments, things along the lines of the Kennedy assassination and 9-11. There's that, just turn on your TV or, and, or probably for more of you, just look at the news on your phone. It's, there's so many bad things, there's so few things that are that impactful that are positive. So I really think that's, that's uh, really, really important to think about. So. Um, Let's see, so some of, the, some of the other reasons to do it are that really very practical. Um, there's a, um, a real economic benefit to doing human space exploration. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's the uh, director of the Hayden uh, Planetarium in New York, uh, gave a really, really interesting talk. You can probably find it somewhere on YouTube, just as you find anything on YouTube. And he talked about the, the, the very practical aspects of exploration. He used at the time, he wasn't talking about space, he was talking about uh, European nations in the 15th, 16th century, the great ocean voyages. And he 
was able to lay out facts and figures of how the, the, uh, the nations that invested in human exploration fared economically, politically, and in terms of their place in the world for the next three or four centuries. And it was a very clear dichotomy between people who had invested in those ocean voyages and taking people and, and pushing the frontier and people who had not. And the ones who explored uh, fared much better uh, in history and over and it was not just 20 years, it was hundreds of years of, of impact. Um, so why, why international? Um, I was part of the space station program uh, when we were negotiating with the Russians. One of my first jobs in, at NASA was to work on the uh, agreements bringing the Russians into the program and revising the agreements with the Japanese, Canadians, and Europeans. And um, the comment before uh, that Fr Franklin Chang Diaz, his experience of we didn't want to be there and they didn't want us there, uh, I can tell you we, we had some very bumpy moments like that. Um, some of the bumpy moments included um, you know, we, we had a, a, NASA had a great idea about how we're going to do uh, integrated operations. And, um, and the way I described it is, uh, we wanted to be married and the Russians wanted to live next door. And that's the best way I can tell it. And those are two very different relationships. We wanted to have a joint bank account, share the fridge, sleep in the same bed. And they were like, yeah, we'll be on the other side of the fence if you need us. We've got a Russian segment and, you know, we'll be glad to, you know, to have some tea with you every once in a while. But it was not a warm relationship. At the time, their, their economy was in extreme disorder, and they were being asked by their overseers uh, in the uh, recently former Soviet Union to uh, to give up Mir-2, which is what they were planning to build. They were in the middle of, of building Mir-2, and uh, and they were trying to, we were having, they were having to adjust to the fact that they were going to be partners with us, their arch enemy. And remember, so this is, back in 1994, the, uh, asking us to partner with the Russians would be about like if today the president said, we're going to do a partner, a joint uh, space program with North Korea. I mean, people's heads almost exploded. The, the, the laws weren't there. The laws were all like, nope, can't talk to them. Nope, can't share anything with them. Nope, you can't show them the back of a, a bag of M&Ms because it's, you know, we're not going to share anything with them. The laws in the, whole, in the whole country had that sort of attitude. And there was much less of a commercial satellite market. It was emerging. It was burgeoning. But it wasn't the way at anywhere near the level it is today. And so it was a very interesting uh, time and situation. But was it hard? Yes. Was it worth it? Yes. Um, because of, um, think about what happened when Columbia happened. We lost the ability in the United States to launch people to orbit. And they saved our bacon. If they hadn't had the, um, the ability to launch and return crews, to provide crew rescue capability on orbit, and to take cargo up there to resupply the space station, we would have had to demand the space station. And it would have, or there would have been no Americans, and there would have been a Russian. You want to talk about a political, a politically unpopular situation. So they they really, really stepped up, and they were partners. We've had a lot of failures, all the, the dissimilar redundancy that was mentioned. We tried so hard, uh, and some of you like that, Paul Paul sitting up there probably remembers this that um, we tried so hard to get them to to have commonality where we could. For some things, that's really important, like for the. Uh, the things that interface with the crew, making sure they have similar displays and, and warning systems. But they were so stubborn, they wanted to keep their stuff exactly the way it was, and we built our stuff the way we wanted it. And thank goodness, thank goodness we never won that fight because we had uh, problems where uh, computers on the U.S. side went down, and fortunately they had, uh, they had attitude control capabilities on the Russian side, and it, it really saved, it saved the space station more than once, that type of thing. So dissimilar redundancy is something that, that comes with um, uh, international partners and is a, a valuable one. The other thing is human space exploration is so expensive. It's, um, it's the, the budgets for it pale. I mean, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the comparison of science robotic missions, it's still expensive because it's still space, but it's a fraction of the cost of the human, the human exploration. No one country can usually have the resources to, to cover it all. Um, it's also unifying. Um, it's something that um, NASA, its whole history, has been used as, a, as an instrument of soft power for the United States. There was a very real foreign policy reason for us uh, being sent to work with the Russians. The Soviet Union had just fallen in the previous year or two, and the country was in turmoil, and it was very, very unstable. And the US government was worried uh, that the Russians were going to turn east and choose the Chinese or the Iranians, very un unfriendly to the United States uh, allies, and they were going to partner with them. So we wanted to make sure we got in there. 
pull their faces towards the west and have them partner with uh, us and our and our um, our allies um, of the more democratic uh, dem democracy based um, civilization. So um, I think the last next thing I'll talk about is, um, is just the broader moments of unity. So what what human exploration brings. Um, December 24th, 1968, and by the way, 1968, if you've ever studied any history, was not a fun year. It was really ugly. It started out in April. Um, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. In June, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Um, the Vietnam War was raging. There was a lot of turmoil with um, uh, the hippie movement was really, really stepping up, and that was the year before the Summer of Love, but it was, but it was, it was really, really, there was a lot of tension just between, say, people you age and your, your, your age and your parents, the generation, there were generational divides. So nothing was going very well. At the end of that year, we had a moment um, that the entire human race shared where Apollo 8 flew around the moon, and there's a very famous photo from, from that trip called Earthrise, and it was the first time that the human race looked back at us on planet Earth as one place. No lines, no, no, no dividers, no political divides, not, you know, you're, you're um, uh, divided by either national origin or race or gender or social beliefs or whatever. It was us as humans, as all humans on the Earth. And it's a very, very powerful image to this day. But that's what the space program has the ability to do. And if you think it's going to be any different when we go back to the moon or when we go to Mars, you're wrong. It's, it will have those same similar unifying impacts. It's like, I mean, I guess you can get that out of a Hollywood movie about aliens. Or suddenly when the aliens come here, everybody cooperates. So uh, anyway, so it's not, it's not that different a dynamic, just a little more realistic. So let's see. Uh, one of the things that I uh, like most about uh, John F. Kennedy's speech at Rice um, uh, his moon speech was the part where he talks about we do these things not because they're easy but because they're hard and in so doing it will serve to organize the best of our abilities. Those words matter so much. And so here you guys are in college getting ready to go out into the working world. My advice to you is do the hardest thing you can do. Well, that's why I like space exploration. I joined the space station program when it was hanging in the balance by one boat. It had almost been canceled in uh, June 1993. I joined in February 1994, right in the middle of bringing the Russians in. And it seemed impossible. I mean, it just seemed unbelievable that we were ever going to get the Russians to cooperate, get the other partners to be happy, get uh, the space, space station built on cost and launch it and actually build it. It seemed like it was just an impossible task. I love that. So what I'll tell you is the benefits of doing, of doing stuff, the hardest thing you can find um, it's going to hone your skills. I can tell you I have advanced in NASA to places I never in a million years thought I would get to because I grew up in space station and it was so dang hard. We had just as one after another of impossible problems and teams and the skills you hone by working through those very, very hard problems will take you far in whatever you choose to do. Um, it yields collateral benefits. I could, NASA publishes a book uh, an inch and a half thick every year um, called spin-up technology. And you probably should look through one of those if you can. Get your hands on it in the library because it is amazing. The stuff that comes out of the space station, uh, all, all this, the, the space program, not just the space station, but the whole, um, uh, the whole space program and what benefits it yields to you um, uh, for life on Earth. You would not have the ability to have this without uh, without the space program, you wouldn't have a lot of things if you were, uh, if you uh, had a sibling or, or if you've had a child that was born prematurely, the space program has helped with that. If you live in a remote area and need telemedicine, the space uh, program has helped with that. Those are not even the most impactful examples, they're just the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, so, you're going to spend a lot of time in your life at work. Um, uh, sometimes it'll be at the expense of your leisure or your family or your friends. Um, make it, do something hard, do something that matters. Um, make sure that all those sacrifices and all that time and effort and work, you can look back and say, that was worth it. Because I know I can look back, I came to NASA to be part of the space station and I wanted to be, uh, I want to be a part of going back to the moon and going to Mars. When I look up at the space station in the sky, I can say, I was part of that. I may not have been the person who, who uh, designed the blueprints. I may not have been the person who turned a, a wrench putting it together. I may not have been the person who pressed the button 
launching uh, the shuttle, taking pieces of the space station up there, but I was part of it. And that's something that gives me tremendous satisfaction. I hope that you guys make choices in your careers and in your aspirations to be able to have that sort of satisfaction because it's awesome. I know a lot of people who don't have that same satisfaction. So I'm very, very fortunate. I hope you will be too. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Saunders, again. It is an honor to have you here. Um, let's all give our panelists and speakers another round of applause for being here. And now, before we break for our networking break, I would like to take a brief moment to introduce our sponsor, Dr. David Alexander, to come up to just say a few words um, about Seds Rice and Space at Rice. Uh, the food's outside, so I'm not going to take too long, but this is just my opportunity to thank everybody here, actually. I mean, Ryan and uh, the SES leaders and the SES team have been absolutely fantastic. I think so far this has been great. The network session is, is going to be the kind of uh, icing on the cake. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the students in the audience for being here and taking the time out of your weekend um, to, to learn from our speakers. And uh, Melanie's been a great uh, friend to us, even through our first pitch at a baseball game a couple of years ago. Um, and then to of course our panelists and to the companies who are here, I think you'll, you'll get to see the talent that our students have. Um, I want to use that as a little bit of opportunity to, um, you saw uh, from, from I think it was Ryan very early on, that we have teams doing CubeSats, Paul Glensky is our lead on, on, the, on the, this very successful recent LSAT announcement, so um, we have a lot of really great talented students, so students coming to me asking about projects about habitats, about rovers, about mining on, on the moon. All of this takes a couple of things. It takes the two M's, mentorship and money. It takes the two C's, collaboration and cash. <laughs> and it takes the two F's, friendship and philanthropy. Um, so if you would like to get involved with our students, if you'd like to be involved with some of these projects in any of those categories, or if you have your own ideas of how you may be able to help our students do the kind of things that they're trying to do uh, in this great world that we have of space exploration. Come and talk to me, talk to Ryan, who will then talk to me. Um, but uh, please, and again, thank you all for being here. Uh, enjoy the, uh, getting to see some of the companies and uh, enjoy the reception. Hopefully we'll see you again next year. Thank you. Thank you all again for attending. Uh, we'll, we will now begin the networking portion of our event. Uh, the students, many of the companies, are accepting resumes and recruiting at this career fair, so please make sure to ask about that. Um, also, if um, you would like to meet some SEDS USA folks, there are some of people on our staff and board of advisors here, so I would definitely make sure to look around, they'll be walking around. Um, I think they're in the back in the middle. They'll raise their hands right there. So uh, make sure to say hi. So if you want to learn more about Seds Rice, visit our website, come to our information booth, talk to our amazing uh, the team that put on this event here today. Uh, please make your way now out into the atrium where we have a fantastic networking event. I hope you enjoyed the Owls in Space Symposium. Thank you again.